Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Terminals Academy. As you know, we have an invisible college. We float from place to place, and tonight we've alighted at the Royal Asiatic Society for whose hospitality we're very grateful. Um, it's always a huge pleasure to introduce Jeremy Reed, um, a poet and lecturer who really needs no introduction. Over the past year or so, I've been refreshing my awareness of Jeremy's work, and I have read, um, I think, around 45 volumes of his poems, extending from the 1970s up to the present. Um, Jeremy's work is continually fresh, continually varied in form, amazingly original in discovering vivid and illuminating imagery. Um, to my mind, he is the important poet of my generation, and I'm delighted to be with him tonight. So Jeremy tonight is commemorating, um, celebrating, mourning, dramatising a year since the death of David Bowie and his talk is appropriately enough entitled Starman. Jeremy. Thank you. Starman. At 4 p.m. in January, the Soho sky, smeared by pollution as an additive, turns optimal cobalt, or on my favourite Faro and Ball colours chart, black blue, underlit by drizzled haze. I'm writing Starman at Patisserie Valerie in Old Compton Street, a residual bohemian cafe that David Bowie would use for intermittent tea breaks when recording round the corner at Trident Studios in St Anne's Court. There's an undervalued song of Bowie's London Boys, written in his late teens and first released on 2nd of December 66 as the B-side of Rubber Band, that not only unalterably fingerprints Bowie as indigenous Londoner, but is seminal to his own lifetime identification with an alienated subspecies, a variant type belonging to a different reality, an alternative demographic fusing the drew delinquent sociopaths of clockwork orange to roaming messianic starmen. At the time of writing London Boys, Bowie was a self-identified mod, fascinated by the movement's immersive culture in fashion, pills and trending music. He was also living with his friend and manager Ken Pitt at 39 Manchester Street, Maribelone, back of Fitzrovia. Bowie's close relationship with Ken Pitt immediately sharpened pointers to his bisexuality, his older guardian and mentor being openly gay and his protégé androgynously beautiful. In his account of the five years they spent together, Ken Pitt writes that the first time he saw Bowie on stage at the Marquis on Sunday, April the 17th, 1966. Quote from Ken Pitt, From my favourite position, leaning against the wall at the back of the club, I could see that he was wearing a biscuit-coloured, hand-knitted sweater, round-necked and buttoned at one shoulder, its skin tightness accentuating his slim frame. I was particularly struck by the artistry with which he used his body, as if it were an accompanying instrument essential to the singer and the song. Unquote. The distinctly homoerotic focus of Pitts on detailing Bowie's jumper, its sexiness on his size zero torso, and what was the three button fastening on the left shoulder, betrays the hawkish male on male design central to Pitts' interest in London's pretty boys. But more importantly to the formative teen Bowie, Pitt was a highly literate reader and book collector, his apartment furnished with a personal library, and was there and encouraged to do so that Bowie picked up on Wilde's Dorian Gray, Jean Genet's Our Lady of the Flowers, Edward Bulmer Lytton's 19th century novel The Coming Race, as well as the dystopian futurology of Orwell's 1984, Anthony Burgess's Clockwork Orange, and the new wave sci-fi of J.G. Ballard and Michael Moorcock as urbane pioneers of ecological crashes, 
and the arrival of altered tourists from the future into our neural pathways. So too the cut-up, chemically driven, non-linear verbal clips of William Burroughs' novels like The Naked Lunch and The Wild Boys, also fed into the young Bowie's ambition to compose musicals and write theatrical adaptions for the stage. But for Bowie, this was an unrealised theatre of imagination, given eventual form through rock configurations like Ziggy Stardust and Diamond Dogs rather than through concretization as a writer, not performer, for the stage. Steeped in apocalyptic dramaturgy, the young Bowie's sci-fi theme vignettes were managed in pop songs, a frustrating medium in that lyrics are usually secondary to the music, a regulation Bowie would happily have reversed. And on Ken Pitt's eclectic bookshelves, he discovered through reading the building blocks of his future personality swaps, Ziggy Stardust, Aladdin Sane, the Sim White Duke, etc., clones or humanoids, to which to reject mini pop operettas. Back to London, boys, with Bowie masking himself as a 17-year-old runaway, pilled up, sexually ambiguous as mods were, hanging out on Wardour Street and learning how to act cool in his chosen milieu sung in a flat, slovenly London voice, expressing a downbeat, fragile vulnerability, the damped, morose sensibility only soars as the song builds with attitude into defiance. Quote, Oh, the first time that you try to pill, you feel a little queasy, decidedly ill. You're going to be sick, but you mustn't lose faith. To let yourself down would be a big disgrace with the London boys. Bowie flattens the vowel in London from an O to a U as part of the song's disaffected, raw digestion of street life. It's probably in sync with how he felt at the time, impatient to succeed but failing. What Pitt neglects to tell us is how tiny Bowie's audience was at the time of first seeing him perform, with one fan commenting on six girls in the front row and a dozen of us queens at the back hanging on his every movement. So, 18 people. At 19, this isn't a deterrent as self-absorption overwrites it and the future seems an indefinitely extensible platform. Bowie's extraordinary look was noted before his music and was to be integrally built into its increasing gradient of success. Its gay referentials were to attract both Ken Pitt and the mime shuffler Lindsay Kemp each drawn singularly to Bowie's disarming, gender-bending sexuality and the potential shapes it could throw at an emergent youth audience. I isolate London Boys with this reference to Bright Light, Soho, Wardour Street as a song preemptively anticipating Soho as Bowie's future workspace with Trident Studios in a cut-off Wardour Street, the modality where he would record the album Space Oddity, the Man Who Sold the World, Hunky Dory, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust, and The Spiders from Mars, Aladdin Sane, and Pinups. The specific West One Grid was to be the hub for his explosive creative energies at a time when his ascendant celebrity as Rock's gender supremacist was at its stardust apogee. At 39 Manchester Square, Bowie adapted to Ken Pitt's decadent fantasiac leanings, the stripped pine floors and Victorian furnishings, the holly green chaise long finished in rosewood, and of course the first edition books by Wilde, Beardsley, Huisman's, and particularly mentioned by Pitt, James, Bald James Baldwin's Nobody Knows My Name and Giovanni's Room, all of which helped flavour the idea that he wasn't like anybody else, and so he would create his own versions of reality and his later assumption, I must be only one in a million on station to station, was another affirmation of the intellectually cold dissociation that so often defeated Ken Pitt's understanding. In later life, Bowie was to comment on his overt emotional freeze as, quote, I always had a repulsive need to be something more than human. I felt very puny as a human. I thought, fuck that, I want to be a superhuman. 
And of course that alien cold is in the depersonalised voice, flat or theatricalised into ambivalent gender, as the narrator of cut-up that keeps him at a remove from direct involvement in the lyric. In fact, after the end of the 60s, Bowie filters all subjective content in his songs through either a persona or sort of cosmonaut alluding to brain chatter in the universe. The methodology originating from Brian Geisen and William Burroughs of atomizing the self into quantum potentialities, fitted with Bowie's notion of multiple identities and not wishing to be fixed by the limitations, as he saw it, of rock. And while Bowie grew into a rock supremacist and inimitably androgynous icon, he always appeared marginally displaced in rock as an arts form that didn't collect him integrally, while at the same time not willing to renounce the celebrity, fame and wealth it provided. It's an arguable fact that most rock stars, including a luminary like Bowie, usually exhaust their creative resource by 40 and don't get better, but simply different. Something in Bowie intuited this right from the start that rock was only a partial expression of a bigger arts infrastructure latent within him. It was also in some weird way a platform to star men, or the beginnings of Bowie's identification with the alien as empathetic association endorsed by his first and only hit single of the 60s, Space Oddity. I'm stopped in my writing this by a skinny guy in a black zippered leather jacket and deconstructed jeans with knee holes, who tentatively tells me he saw me before at the horse hospital with the ginger light, and the shift in time and place travelled mentally puts me in a bilocated window as I thank him for his appreciative comments. I noticed too the Thai girl sitting at the table next to me had new makeup and two-tone blended eyeshadow, burnt orange dusted into gold. And with earbuds in, she's in a split dimension. Her makeup's how I imagine Mars. I get back to Major Tom. Bowie's fictional astronaut launched through space oddity as an instantly durable counterculture anti-hero in the way of J.G. Ballard's subversive protagonist, Robert Vaughan, in the novel Crash, with Bowie Tom getting off on the astronaut plume of the Apollo 2 mission as the first manned moon landing five days after the release of Space Oddity on the 11th of July, 1969. Recorded at Trident Studios, Major Tom's virtual space tourism seemed real object travel, and Bowie's voice pitched suitably off-world. So who is this Brixton interloper? Wised up on space travel, UFOs, aliens, time slip, futurology, and still without a hit record after three years of mutant pop experimentation. Bowie's opportune purchase on the International Space Program got him the top ten hit he so desperately needed after an agonizingly slow, long haul to number five by placing him in the parallel processing of London and the Stars. The lyric gets off modern, ground control to Major Tom, take your protein pills and put your helmet on. Only Tom is a rogue astronaut who is off mission, but here am I sitting in a tin can far above the world. Planet Earth is blue and there's nothing I can do or anyone about Tom's evident dissociated self-destruct. But we got the blue right, as for an observer in space, the water bodies reflect the colour of sky that appear blue because of the way sunlight is selectively scattered as it goes through our atmosphere. The chart's success and realistic sci-fi incorporated into space oddity, the word oddity being equally applicable to Bowie in his creative quest, pushed Pop's frontiers into tech at a time when psychedelia's saturated colour wavelengths promoted journeys out of the body into neural rather than physical space. Bowie was largely out there, alienated and alone within the remit of Pop's acid pioneers reporting back from the future. Bowie was Tom and Tom Bowie as empathy swap, 
something perfectly consistent with his psychological need to put a character between himself and the song. Quote from Bowie, As an adolescent, I was painfully shy, withdrawn. I didn't really have the nerve to sing my songs on stage, and nobody else was doing them. I decided to do them in disguise, so that I didn't have to actually go through the humiliation of going on stage and being myself. It was this additionally layered disguise of first-person Bowie that built the impenetrable mystique integrated into his myth as intraspecies or replicant, but also basically glacial, cold-climate English, the formal reserve of Bowie's British generation of the 40s and 50s as generational characteristic. There's a photo of Bowie extending a handshake to David Hockney on the occasion of their first meeting backstage at Los Angeles Forum in 1976 that says it all in refrigerated formality. The divisive is psychological miles, charm preceding gesture, as the distance he establishes between himself and Hockney with Christopher Isherwood immediately <laughs> looking on is the maximum attainable in physical space. It's quite literally alien contact. Emitting little physical warmth between two contemporary artists drawn to but perhaps suspicious of each other's magnitude. Bowie's Soho, where I'm writing this, extended along Wardour Street to the Marquis Club at number 90 and almost next door to the ship at 110 an Edwardian pub with chocolate-coloured tiles, dark wood panelling and stained glass, where he conducted early impromptu interviews with music journalists through scrolls <coughs> of blue cigarette smoke. There was also the Mocha Bar on Frith Street, and tucked into Soho's niche yards, Peter Burton's Le Deuce in lugubrious Darby Muse, a gay mod disco where clubbers threw their recreational pills into the aquarium tank when raided by the police. <coughs> Bowie's Soho topology, that was his geographical locus for the first formative decade of his career, also included practice sessions at Charlie Chester's Casino on Archer Street, or in a warren of rooms and brothels on Windmill Street, when Soho was essentially red light, as well as socialising at the Regency Club, a hangout for the notorious Cray Twins and their extortionist racket. Bowie and his mid-sixties band parked a military green Bedford van in potholed Ham Yard, its panels scrawled on with pink lipstick by early fans. Soho fame was right on the moment of what was happening. It was the epicentre of emergent British rock and youth culture, and Bowie was local but still relatively unknown outside its trending bohemian milieu. Photos taken on the rooftop of the Manchester Street apartment by Ken Pitt show Bowie with fashionable, long, mod-styled hair and deep collar button-down shirts before his transitioning morph into wearing dresses and full makeup after meeting Angela Barnett in 1969 and going trans for the withdrawn album sleeve cover of The Man Who Sold the World. As vibrant colouring to the often edgy, potentially violent Soho the nascent star man inhabited. I quote from Chris Moore, who worked at Charlie Chester's Casino during this period for accents, aspects of B-side thuggery. Quote, There was a slightly dangerous side to working in Soho in those days. Heated arguments would often ensue as immediate entry was refused. The staff break room and canteen was above the horseshoe casino. I can remember standing in the reception at Charlie Chester's for 20 minutes smoking cigarettes and watching the violence in the street unfold rather than run the gauntlet and try and cross the road. <coughs> Chester's doormen were definitely of a different breed in those days. I vividly remember one of the crew being a small, overweight, red-faced man in his early 40s. He was known as Mick the Hammer, a nickname reputedly acquired from his earlier days as a member of the Cray Gang. However, whilst the pedigree of the Chester's doorman was undoubtedly dubious, they teamed together perfectly to create a hermetic seal 
from the violent undercurrent that ran through Soho in those days. Finish quote. But Soho also had a place for pretty boys in makeup like David Bowie and endemic mods who competitively swanked transitioning Carnaby Street fashion into gossipy coffee bars like Bar Italia, Mocha, and where I'm writing at Patisserie Valerie, surrounded by mixed fruit tart cognoscenti. It rains outside, and I'm reminded by new scientists it hasn't rained on the moon for four billion years. Four billion years. Bowie simply couldn't find a follow-up hit single to endorse the chart success of Space Oddity. But in 1969, he wrote his next interplanetary excursion with Life on Mars as another attempt at putting pop into the helium-torched high-tech plume of rocket science. Bowie described how he wrote the song, quote, Workspace was a big empty room with a chaise long, a bargain price Art Nouveau screen, William Morris, so I told anyone who asked. A huge overflowing freestanding ashtray and a grand piano. Little else, I started working it out on the piano and had the whole lyric and melody finished by late afternoon. Life on Mars that was held back from the album The Man Who Sold the Earth to be released as a piano-led cinematic melange sci-fi track on his breakthrough fourth studio album Hunky Dory while the track is not specifically about Mars, but more a blend of ludic surrealism with kitsch, cults substituting for politics, the plot suggests in Bowie's imagination not only America's unrest over Vietnam, but recognisable strains of universal psychoses that point to Mars as an alternative planet for migrant astronauts. So there is only a small symbiotic relationship between the red planet's rocky desert landscapes and thin carbon dioxide atmosphere and Earth's provision of water to transport reactive molecules like hydrogen, carbon monoxide and ammonia. Our collective consciousness has always targeted Mars as Earth too. And Bowie's song does that almost 50 years before the initialization of Mars One, a private spaceflight project proposing to land the first humans on Mars by 2024 as a one-way destination only. The selection discussions also introducing how willing the stringently chosen astronauts would be to become cannibals in order to survive. Life on Mars, which arguably would have been Bowie's ideal follow-up to Space Oddity, lyrically maps out something of his clockwork orange J.G. Ballard-inspired overview on dystopian themes. Like all fragmented lyric cut up, we know the meaning without the need for explanation. Having scorched Vietnam with the defoliant Agent Orange, America faced civil riot from its youth, and this violent turbulism was taken up in London too. But for Bowie, writing a song the process has morphed into an anarchic, imaginative documentation of potential futures that revisit us as wars. If the song got little attention on its initial release, then its reissue as a single in 1973 on the back of Bowie's Ziggy Stardust fame took it to number three in the charts. Mick Rock filmed and directed a promotional video backstage at Ells Court to accompany the record's release in which a heavily made-up Bowie, wearing a turquoise suit designed by Freddie Buretti, personifies sexual alien, or the characteristics of a new subculture species to which Bowie imagined himself integrated into the emergent Zeekist. It was this belief in being set apart that led to Bowie throwing political gestures like a Nazi salute at Victoria Station in 1976 as a self-designed instrument of gender-bending elitism. Of the dichotomy in his own personality, he remarked, quote, off stage I'm a robot, on stage I achieve emotion. It's probably why I prefer dressing up as Ziggy to being David. And it was the elevation of his impossibly high cheekbones as facial scaffolding that gave Bowie a Greta Garbo look something accentuated by his two mismatched eyes that weren't as often assumed two different colours, but the result of anascoscoria, 
a condition characterised by an unequal size in a person's pupils. In Bowie's case, his left pupil was permanently dilated. This can create the illusion of having different coloured eyes, because the fixed pupil does not respond to change in light, while the right pupil does. It was the disconcerted look this accident created gave Bowie the association with aliens or visitors from the future, a connotation enhanced, of course, by his playing the role of extraterrestrial mutant in the Nicholas Rogue movie, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Bowie's role in a film based on Walter Trevis' 1963 novel of the same name helped consolidate the myth that his origins were off-world and that it was in some way an interplanetary plenipotentiary, something further enforced by his supernova arrival with (coughs) Ziggy Stardust and the spiders from Mars. The the name suggested an immersion not only in H.P. Lovecraft and Ballard, but a generation of sci-fi writers like Ray Bradbury, James Blish, Thomas Dish, Brian Aldiss, etc., and the lurid Technicolor covers of their mass-market paperbacks with dusty planetary sunsets like the high-res shock tactics of Bowie's nasturtium red coloured hair. Sci-fi and the mix of French psychedelics was in the air, a generation mining Middle Earth, acid, sexual ambiguity, ufology, smoke botanicals, was awaiting its rock messiah, its liberated avatar in the form of Ziggy, patron saint of deviated glamour, urban apocalypse, and pushing personal boundaries to rock and roll suicides. New wave science fiction reduced in the late 60s and 70s, with its focus on soft as opposed to hard science, had turned inward psychologically, and like Bowie, looked to encounter the alien on Earth. In a remarkable essay called Inner Space as the Compass for Creative Orientation, J.G. Ballard, as pioneering futurist, wrote, quote, The biggest developments of the immediate future will take place not on the moon or Mars, but on Earth, as it is inner space, not outer, that needs to be explored. The only true alien planet is Earth. In the past, the scientific base of sci-fi has been towards the physical sciences, rocketry, electronics, cybernetics, and the emphasis should switch to the biological sciences. It is that inner space suit which is still needed, and it is up to science fiction to build it. And that, to me, is the premises of all good modern writing, the inner space suit. Whether Bowie was aware or not of Ballard's essay pointing the stars into our neural pathways rather than making them the subject of object travel, He was certainly influenced by Ballard's fiction in which urban landscapes, rather than space colonisation, are the domain of the aberrant psychopaths, rather than the re-anatomised tribes of biomorphs native to real or invented planets. Ballard, leading into Bowie's creations in the early 70s, clearly saw that the alien was apparent in the human, and that sci-fi was now a reality programmed into our electronic networks rather than the resource of higher intelligence, theoretically located, say, in the hypercarbon lakes of Saturn's moon Titan. And by applying a sci-fi imagination to real geography, often located in the London suburbs or in culturally altered American landscapes, Ballard, in his seminal novel The Atrocity Exhibition, 1970, condensed post-apocalyptic excerpts of dystopian modernity, split by iconic images of John F. Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe into a bizarre synthesis of the fragile dissolve between imagined atrocities and realities. Using a method like William Burroughs of converting linear time into non-linear film frames, Ballard bounced narrative down into episodic vignettes in which obsessions with car sex, reconfigurations of Kennedy's assassination, B-movie psychiatrists, urban zombies, and the manipulable sexual images of Marilyn Monroe and Ronald Reagan occupy a confused, violent presence. The novel, A Blueprint for Crash, in which Ballard explores symphoraphilia and car crash fetishism, provides some of the most innovative poetry of its period, 
and I see Ballard as much a poet as I do novelist in his use of implosive visual imagery that leaves most poets a very long way behind. I'm not arguing that Ziggy Stardust comes directly out of Ballard, but Bowie's persona Ziggy occupies the same sort of post-apocalyptic ethos, particularly in songs like Five Years and Moon Age Daydream, that invent fractured mini-narratives lifted into immediacy by Mick Ronson's guitar weaponry. It's Ronson's playing that provides the often spooky soundtrack to Ziggy's alien posturing as transgender rock star, and in some ways we can credit the platinum-haired Mick Ronson of being the first sci-fi glam rock guitarist. And due to Ken Pitt having brought back an acetate of the Velvet Underground's Banana album at the end of the 60s as benchmark drug-stripped garage, Bowie was not only performing Lou Reed's I'm Waiting for the Man and White Light, White Heat live ahead of his contemporaries, but learned from Reed how to construct songs about the urban underclass and street culture written into the metropolis. Though certainly Ballard's visionary broking of near futures is fiction mixed with Lou Reed's cold lyric snapshots of the Warhol entourage at the factory, with the inspirational prototypes behind Bowie's scary postmodern fictions, seeming Ziggy Stardust, Aladdin Sane, and the most ambitious concept of all, Diamond Dogs. Ziggy Stardust, as the human manifestation of an alien channeling extraterrestrial info, as well as representing the definitive rock star consumed by burnout and finally suicide, gave Bowie a persona that was bigger than him at the time of recording the album. Now 25, and like all aliens, including me, Bowie was a futures tourist, observed with suspicion and still lacking a hit to endorse his increasingly spectacular androgyny. Whatever the origins of Ziggy Stardust, like Vince Taylor, the tragically eclipsed rock star with whom Bowie identified, Ziggy is, of course, an amalgam of Bowie's own real and imagined characteristics, and in that sense, a clone or peripheral unleashed on the times, in the same way as Robert Vaughan in Ballard's Crash personifies the deviated extremes of the author's sexual imaginings. And the name Ziggy perfectly accommodates onomatopoeically our received notion of what an alien or star man might perhaps be called if we were to encounter an off-world contact. Bowie later suggested to Q magazine in a 1990 interview that the name Ziggy came accidentally from a tailor's shop, Ziggy's, that he passed on the train and that the memorable name had, quote Bowie, that Iggy Pop connotation. But it was a tailor's shop and I thought well, this whole thing is going to be about clothes. So it was my own little joke calling him Ziggy. So Ziggy Stardust was a real compilation of things. Unquote. There's never any specific cause of an imaginative creation, whatever it is, but more a cluster of dominant associations that synthesise in the process of developing a theme. Singular, but integrating, constellating motives as a plurality. Ziggy, dressed in brightly quilted zoot suits, made up by Freddy Buretti from sumptuous fabrics purchased from Liberty, or silk patterned dresses, camping it as an effeminate queen, polarising the attention of both sexes, launched his image at a wider public through his career-changing appearance with the single Starman on top of the pops in July 1972. For a nation of pop viewers, it was literally their first contact with a spiky, flame-haired androgyne, playing an aqua-coloured guitar, dressed in patched Liberty Ensemble with laced-up boxing boots dyed scarlet. The song, a gentle pop-rock, predominantly acoustic excursion into E.T. context, and preempting the Ziggy Stardust album, describes Ziggy receiving a message from an alien through the radio, the source of the signal, from the spooky third kind. Quote, Look out your window, you can see his light. If we can sparkle, he may land tonight. Don't tell your papa or he'll get us locked up in fright, Bowie sings, looking again to children as more openly receptive to alien contact. And as a race, 
set apart by active imagination and likely to be locked up if they express truth about a visionary experience. In an interview with William Burroughs for Rolling Stone, Bowie made it very clear that Ziggy is the recipient of the message and not the extraterrestrial carrier. In Bowie's case of third mind category, Starman, although released three years later and peaking at number 10, is the logical successor to Space Oddity in terms of chart and planet hopping his way to recognition. Made up as an intraspecies transgender rock purveyor of alien speak, Bowie was a uniquely untouchable phenomenon as Ziggy Supernova arrived as the leper messiah to an expectant generation looking out exactly for him. Bowie's moment had finally arrived. He put on what Ballard called his inner spacesuit. Patisserie Valerie at 3.30 p.m. The light outside is like a frosty green diamond. And the view through the window is like watching CCTV footage and the images are sharper. I took time out from writing my Bowie document by writing a poem to feed my addiction to poetry from which I can rarely separate. I speak to Teresa, a friend rather than a waitress, and she tells me that after drinking three bottles of wine last night, she fell off the stepladder while attempting to paint her ceiling purple. Her right hip is bruised and sore, but she doesn't care. The booze is worth the fall, and the DIY, a compulsive fetish, she likens to sex on an ironing board. Released on the 16th of June, 1972, the concept album Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, the title sounding more like a hard science sci-fi novel by Frank Herbert or Samuel Delaney, as lurid pulp evocation of interplanetary beasts crawling across scorched Martian canyons, depicted on the covers of early ballad paperback novels like The Burning World, 1964. In fact, it's the dystopian, eruptive flame-out of Ballard's The Disaster Area and the Atrocity Exhibition that bleeds into Bowie's urban space boy apocalypse, and particularly in the potentous opener and my favourite track, Five Years. With the message come true that the planet is only five years and with echoes of 1984 incorporated into the package, Bowie's vignettes of condensed catastrophe were a first for pop. Quote, you'll all know this. A girl my age went off her head, hit some tiny children. If the black hadn't have pulled her off, I think she would have killed them. A soldier with a broken arm fixed his stare to the wheels of a Cadillac. A cop knelt and kissed the feet of a priest, and a queer threw up at the sight of that. Five Years is a rock poem, a story of mutant cross-cultures and defiant edgewalkers that belong partly to Ballard and partly to John Reckie's Hustler novel, City of the Night. I stay with it as Ziggy, cites his alien contact, questioning and correcting what he sees. Quote, I think I saw you in an ice cream parlour, drinking milkshakes cold and long, smiling and waving and looking so fine, don't think you knew you were in this song and it was cold and it rained and I felt like an actor and I thought of Ma and I wanted to get back there your face, your race the way that you talk I kiss you, you're beautiful I want you to walk it's intensely moving within the context of the song how Ziggy perceives his alien counterpart who doesn't know he is in the song doing normal in an ice cream parlour or a Soho wimpy more like while Ziggy stands outside in the rainy cold. This is the moment in the song of cold alienation, the recognition of different races, and finally the physical union, I kiss you, you're beautiful, almost as an act of narcissistic conjugation. Bowie conceived of his star men as, quote, infinites or, quote, black hole jumpers, who impartially planet hopped across the universe, bringing news of catastrophe without any antidote or deterrent to survive it. Ziggy Stardust, inspired according to Bowie by Burroughs's Nova Express and the Wild Boys, was originally intended to be a multimedia theatrical performance with 40 cut-up scenes making the show radically different every night 
the accidental, accounting for the variant. In a Rolling Stone interview discussion between Bowie and Burroughs, Burroughs punched home the point that, quote, the weapon of the wild boys is a Bowie knife, an 18-inch Bowie knife. Did you know that? Bowie's sci-fi, dystopian, or conceivable nightmare future, a fusion of Burroughs and Ballard, is projected as a glam rock endgame, the terminal point of his own youth, as well as the near para suicide of the planets. In the rocky, fabulous Moon Age daydream, Bowie morphs Ziggy into a polymorphic humanoid, a shape-shifting space shaman. Quote, I'm an alligator. I'm a mama papa coming for you. I'm the space invader. I'll be a rock and roll bitch for you. Keep your mouth shut. You're squawking like a pink monkey bird. And I'm busting up my brains for the words. Bowie was already discovering, much to his own profound disillusionment, that rock was arguably too exhaustively superficial a frame for the concept in which he was engaged, despite the fame it brought him. Although he was to pursue the theme further through the album Aladdin Sane and Diamond Dogs, Rock and Roll's Suicide of Ziggy Stardust is a sort of predictive finale of his trajectory as a commodified rock star with an identifiable band. Writing these songs on which his own career in music acutely depended, Bowie saw himself as old in a modality exploited by youth. In other words, he was five years behind his anticipated expectations. Quote, you're too old to lose it, too young to choose it, and the clock waits so patiently on your song. You walk past the cafe, but you don't eat when you live too long. Oh no, no, you are rock and roll suicide. It's not overstating interpretation to suggest that something of Bowie literally dies in this song. The pop protégé Ken Pitt worked so hard to place commercially when Bowie was unable to find hit songs and marketable focus throughout the second half of the 60s had experienced celebrity and overdosed on its negative aspects. Looking back on the phrase which the song opens, time takes a cigarette, Bowie was to intellectualise it by saying much later, quote, This was a sort of plagiarised line from Baudelaire, which was something to the effect of life is a cigarette, smoke it in a hurry, or savour it. At the time of Ziggy, Bowie didn't have the luxury of time, just the intense awareness of now or never. It's likely that Bowie's particular star man will never go away in the context of creativity, through his singularly introducing the figure of the alien into pop, and through Major Tom, the progressive reality of the astronaut brokering not only a moon base, but creating microgravity industrialized systems in the near galaxy. But for me, that trajectory into off-world demographics comes back to the song London Boys and Bowie's 60s Soho, with frequent visits to the Wallace Collection in Manchester Square and Pollock's Toy Museum in Fitzrovia, the eclectic oddity of which fascinated him to the point of inspired distraction. At the time, surfing the mod wave into its update of period revival dress and psychedelics, Bowie was a questioning outsider, quizzing youth culture for a place to let him in, but remaining peripheral to its hub, his ambitions too big at the time for his immediate talents. We can imagine him sitting in Bar Bruno on the lip of Wardour Street, breathing into a frothy espresso and wondering if it would all ever happen for him, soaked in pop hits, but wanting inwardly and compulsively to pioneer new cultural frontiers that linked literary fiction to rock. London Boy seems to me the existential start of the extraterrestrially themed project, finding its culmination in the rock theatrical Ziggy Stardust and the spiders from Mars. Soho again, Wardour Street. I finish riding and face into a mashed strawberry sunset finish over the Piccadilly point of Brewer Street. Writing about Bowie takes me back to Trident and St Anne's Court, still a dark twist on the Soho compass, but with a constant stream of foot traffic navigating north-south. It's rained while I've been inside writing. 
and there's a damp lick to the alley that Bowie would have known on rainy days, and that elusive smell of the city's wet skin exuding dirt. I stay maybe five minutes in thought, a sort of Bowie-directed zen, then hurry off for a drink. Thank you. Multicoloured, imitationistic, many angled view, which located Bowie so richly in the culture of his time and influences literally musical, mm -hmm. personal, sartorial, the whole works. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if people have any, any questions or things they'd like to me to pursue further. Yes, I think you said that um, uh, work seemed to get better as opposed to just change. Could you say something about his later work things in it that you find interesting? Well, in this little talk, naturally, because Bowie is a cosmos himself, I only isolated his Soho years and Ziggy. So everybody has their own favourite Bowie, of course, whichever decade you like. I suppose my favourite is his Berlin trilogy from the late 70s. But... Yes, everyone. I don't really know anything more about him than that period of his work, so yes. I'm interested in uh, knowing something, uh, uh, comments from you, perhaps you're familiar with the rest of his yes. work up Yes, absolutely, yeah. Anybody else like to ask anything? Be brave. I was wondering whether you'd like to say a little more about how Bowie's work may have influenced your own. Well... I think being an alien myself and having been the first poet really to put sci-fi, extraterrestrialism, science, etc. in a very modern way into poetry, Bowie has always been seminal archetype to me. The look, of course, um, the very ambiguously sexed lyrics, um, the always pointing forwards into another place, another time, yeah, has been of enormous influence to me. And of course, I've listened like most of you here, consistently to almost everything he's done. Um, but, yes, his exceptionalism is what interests me. I'm always interested in another species, a race apart, um, because that's where poetry comes from. It's that form of, you know, contact between something which is an intelligence independent of you, which kind of looks after you, so you don't get beaten up in the street or anything like that. Um, and it's always there feeding you, so that's very important. And Bowie's sort of particularly with the beginnings of Ziggy Stardust, personified that. And before that, the early work, particularly around the London Boys period, has an incredibly human, lost, alienated feel to it when he's trying to find his way, which I find personally very moving. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, I've got, I've got another one. Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you. I was particularly focused by what you just said. One of the things that came through very strongly is the sense that what Bowie is writing about all the time, ultimately, is a kind of loneliness. Yes, an alienation. Yeah, I mean, which may come from that extreme shyness yes. of his early days. But do you, do, do, did he ever integrate with or commune with anything, or was his communion only with that isolation and loneliness? I think that's perfect, uh, perfectly put, Gravel. I think the communication is with the alienation. Mm -hmm. Like, Bowie is never involved in his lyrics. They are cut-up comment statements. There is no personal emotion, no work out of anything in a song. So he remains, in a way, the sort of um, star man spokesman for another species, for an objective future that's always driving forward. Um, you know, into songs like Speed of Life, uh, Another Place, Another Time. They're always moving somewhere where he isn't. And it's the same with my poetry. I'm interested in tourists from the future rather than the sort of Philip Larkin rubbish of what's right under your thumb. Um, 
So that's what always attracted me to Bowie, the sense that you don't have to belong here. And, you know, the alienation in his work, probably accentuated a lot by drugs in the 70s, is what is so fantastic about it. And I think if any of you want to go online and have a look at the handshake, handshake I described between him and David Hockney, with um, Christopher Isherwood in the background, you'll see the incredible distance in Bowie and that almost his arm is coming out of his socket to keep away from the person he's shaking hands with, which kind of defines his emotions in a way and at the same time makes that so incredibly alluring. Who is this man who came from Brixton and yet also simultaneously comes from the stars? And for me, inalienable to that... <coughs> is my great teacher in writing and somebody I regard as the greatest poet of the 20th century, J.G. Ballard, even though he's classified as a novelist. Five lines of Ballard's imagery delete most poets' lifetimes' work. Ballard is such a supreme genius, he can only be classified alongside Bowie and that the two are working together in dystopian landscapes but never separated from the human. That Ballard, as he said, placed... Um, all alienation on Earth. As Ballard said, the only alien planet is Earth, and you adopt an inner space suit. And that's what Bowie did so fantastically, adopt the inner space suit from which to project extraterrestrial worlds. Um, probably in you know a couple of hundred years, visiting extraterrestrials here will listen to Moon Age Daydream, um, because that will be right on their particular wavelengths. And poetry should do the same, you know, those poetries grounded specifically in the present, whereas the present is something you've left behind already to get into the future which you're moving into. In the way that William Burroughs always said, there is no true photograph, because the second, microsecond you take the photograph, the person's already moved on. And you get that sense in Bowie's albums always, station to station, low, heroes, Right up to the next day, his penultimate album, this incredible speed of moving somewhere, which is the only alternative, perhaps, to the uncomfortableness of the present. And that, to me, is what is so great about Bowie, that you kind of see him, you know, moving along a highway at enormous speed into a future you haven't yet apprehended. And, of course, the look, which is sensational, probably the best-looking pop star ever in history. <laughs> the, the extraordinary face and the absolute beauty of the features is in itself an exceptional gift given to him to be exactly who he was, somebody set apart and utterly marvellous. To my way of reading. <laughs> yes? So, is there anything to say about Ursula Le Guin and always coming home? No, don't know as Le Guin's work, sadly, but I'm sure it's wonderful. I've heard a lot of good things about it. Right. It's a projection of a, a future time when all the industrial detritus has gone down in, in California. Right. And what is the novel called? Always Coming Home. Thank you, yeah. Yep. Well, that's, yeah, that's excellent. I will have a look at that book. Just one more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh. No, you were. Oh, okay. Um, do, do you think there's any virtue, more morally speaking, in seeking out and cultivating alienation, or do you think, well, there is virtue in, in the opposite, and attempting to resolve it? I don't think you seek out alienation. You are alien. You can't seek something. You actually are it. It's like you can't want to be a poet. You're either born a poet or you're not one. Um, and therefore I think the sense of alienation for Bowie is a completely natural characteristic. It's the feeling of being separate and apart which leads the work into an increase of alienation. No moral connotations are attached to alienation in any way. It is simply an existential state. It's a state of being. If you feel alienated in the crowd, you are experiencing an existential alienation. So... Does that help at all? Well, things which one experiences, yes. one can have an attitude towards to try to increase them, to decrease them, or to solve them. I mean, just the fact that something is doesn't mean it's, it, it's right or... It's, it's no, but right. if, you're, if your creative starting point is alienation, why would you wish to decrease it? You surely capitalise on it and work with it. Because, you know, creative people aren't integrated into society. They're always a step apart as well, because that work requires a very special space. 
and therefore you can't just be rammed into the crowd as a person in the crowd. You are, but you have to have that remove. And I think that's what Bowie, to a very large extent, does so fantastically. If we're not just yes. a resource. A resource, yeah. yes, you're absolutely right. But for a normal human being, it could be a psychoanalytic problem, yes. I agree. <laughs> but we're not talking about normal human beings tonight. <laughs> what's, the, what's the one more question? One more, yes. Um, yeah, I was just um, going to ask about contemporary slavery. Um, yes. How you think Bowie might have responded to that and sort of thinking about it in relation to your question, actually, your, your answer to that question about how he would have, sort of, how he sort of had a almost a comfort in being an outsider. Yes. And Soho is sort of increasingly somewhere that doesn't have spaces for the alien or the queer and it's you know it's got this sort of spectacular dystopic regeneration occurring. Yes, and that's beautifully I put. How you think you might have responded Well that. You know, there's a lot of Bowie's Soho, as I described, which is still there, of course. You can still go to the ship pub, you can still go to those places, but of course, yeah, the social context has changed radically, of course. We can't think ourselves back to when he was in all those coffee bars and places throughout the mid to late 60s and the first, say, three or four years of the 70s. Um, but yes, if he was alive today, probably like me, he would use Soho as a creative basis. I write there every afternoon because it still has a tang of the bohemian. It still has a tolerance towards people who are artistically different. Um, all of that. So, yeah, it would be very different. Of course it would. Incredibly different. Because it's become so commercialised and commodified, which in his day, it would have been largely brothels and just cafes and restaurants because it was the big red light area where girls were allowed to hang out on the street and Piccadilly rent boys up the road also so Bowie would have known that ethos very very differently um, so yeah commodifications would have changed his views of it obviously but as you know and you probably all know about a year before he died when he'd been diagnosed with cancer he came back secretly to London in disguise to visit everywhere which had been on his map at that time. Um, Bowie was very good at disguise because he usually, if he went on the tube, he'd read a Chinese newspaper, um, <laughs> put on glasses and an old hat or something like that. He often said that he could walk out through the crowds queuing up to see him and they wouldn't recognise him because he was very good at disguise. And so if you'd seen a very good-looking man reading a Chinese newspaper on the tube, that would have been David Bowie. <laughs> or, or a very good-looking Chinese man. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Except he probably would have been in a crumpled hat and dark glasses, so he wouldn't quite have seen everything. But as you know, probably what, of course, is also marvellous about him, and we need to finish soon, is the fact that he, because... His looks were so much a part of his creativity, he retained those looks virtually until the onset of cancer. The beauty of the features and the body, etc., were maintained throughout his life in an extraordinary way, which was given to him, of course, by some superior force to be the body that he worked with. I mean, you're not just dumped here. Everybody has their own incarnation, and that was his to be exceedingly beautiful. And he'll always be remembered for that as well as the work. Thank you, Thank anyhow, you, all of you for coming. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Terminos Academy and also to the Royal Asiatic Society. Um, this is an occasion I always look forward to keenly. Um, it's become um, an, an annual event that um, Jeremy comes to give us one of his um, stimulating, exciting, wholly original lectures. Um, and tonight I think it's particularly thrilling. I've, I've been hoping for many years to hear Jeremy speak about Ted Hughes. Um, Jeremy himself is, is certainly Britain's most, most prolific <coughs> and 
original and listen-taking poet. Um, and it's going to be wonderful to hear him exploring the work of um, another holy individual, deeply risk-taking, um, massively creative poet, um, Ted Hughes. And um, since today is November the 5th, um, we're certainly going to be in for the burst of fireworks. <laughs> and um, Jeremy will undoubtedly provide them. So it's a great delight to introduce Jeremy Thank Reed, who so is going to speak bro. on raw Anna. power, Anna. Ted Hughes, and the archetypal underworld. Thank you, and I'd like to have you introduce me. Thank you. So <laughs> Jeremy. As you know, I don't give any introductions. Raw power. It's unlikely that on February the 7th, 1973, Bluely snowed in at Court Green, his roomy, ancient manor house in North Torton, Devon, that any remotest leak would have reached Ted Hughes at the release on that day of Raw Power by Iggy and the Stooges, a proto-punk album of Garage Agro, with David Bowie credited as its producer, the two having met the previous year at the celebrity nightclub Maxis Kansas City in New York City. The incongruity of the two artists isn't, however, gratuitous, and that Hughes's savagely ferile persona Crow, arguably the most brutally realised avenger in British poetry, incorporates a mythic ferocity every bit the propulsive equivalent of Iggy's three-chord, corrosively paint-stripping search and destroy. Published three years before the release of Raw Power, Hughes's book-length sequence belongs to the same turbulent generational mix of cultural upheaval surrounding the late 60s transitioning into the politically rebarbative 70s. And is the opening stanza of Iggy's Search and Destroy so very different in its declarative mission to unconditionally annihilate than Hughes's declared war on theogony in the chiliastic arena of Crow? I quote Iggy, I'm a street-walking chica with a heart full of napalm. I'm a runaway son of the nuclear A-bomb. I'm the world's forgotten boy, the one who searches and destroys. By any measure of pop lyrics, Iggy's menacingly paranoid protagonist with a heart full of napalm explodes musically into a world threatened to this moment by nuclear meltdown in a way that is both surreal and quasi-real. In notes for a little play from Crow. Hughes depicts the same atrocity of potential end times as two survivors engaged in an agonised ritual performed under a giant red sun coming closer. Quote from Ted, Mutations at home in the nuclear glare, horrors, hairy and slobbery, glossy and raw. They sniff towards each other in the emptiness. They fasten together. They seem to be eating each other. Eating each other. Hughes' stylistic experiment in mythic narrative that drives Crow saw him stripping the richly metaphoric language of his earlier poetry down to the components of raw existential ontology in which no form of mediating intervention interrupts the maniacal ferocity of primal chaos. Crow was written between 1966 to 69 on the back of Hughes's personal shattering with the suicides of both his wife Sylvia Plath in February 1963 followed in March 1969 by his then partner Asia Wevel, killing herself and their four-year-old daughter Shura. Both suicides were by gas, resulting in carbon monoxide poisoning, with Plath 
insulating the kitchen with towels to protect her children who were sleeping upstairs, and Wevel, almost as a copy of Plath's death six years earlier, sealing the kitchen door and window, then dissolving 35 Sonomil sleeping tablets in a glass of water, chased down with whiskey, and then turning on the Mayflower cooker. It's of note, too, in terms of impacting shock, shock, that Hughes wasn't the initial discoverer of either body, with Plath found by her appointed nurse, Myra Morris, with the help of a workman, Charles Langbridge, who broke the door down, and Wevel by the family's au pair, Else Ludwig, who found the two lying together on a mattress in the kitchen in their Clapham, South London flat. The crow is sealed by an almost vanta black mood of desperate revolt in the unaccommodated universe is understandable given Hughes's inevitable immersion in guilt and unquestionable dumb tragedy at the time of writing. Unable to alter or repair the past, Hughes unleashed Crow as an ambivalent affirmer destroyer with a mythic trickster's dynamic to incite controversy by epic lawlessness. Or do we, in reading Crow, personalise Hughes' protagonist into a black embodiment of his own psyche at the time of writing? We tend to read the poet, mm, and not the person. The ruin of someone half-drunk, facing their own darkest corners in a cold kitchen, writing to try and make sense of unaccountable history gone wrong, and drinking more to try desperately to get above it. Desperately to get above it. What the public read is a book rather than its making, its wonky case history. What does Iggy say in Search and Destroy? Soul radiation in the dead of night, love in the middle of a firefight. Lines that could be used as a definition of writing a poem out of disturbing, colliding emotional conflicts. If Crow was seen as a radical departure from Hughes's earlier work, in which his viewpoint is nature observing man rather than man sentimentalizing nature, then his romantic muscle as animistic shaman was the celebrated antithesis to Philip Larkin's ball shriveling poetic impotence of two acerbic poems a year to validate the typically careerist poet. Hughes was by contrast the indomitably inspired visionary of a type Cree conditioned to create and by comparison making Larkin appear inherently pedestrian. If Crow reads like a radical departure to Hughes's readers with his disarranged forms and aggravated diction, then his first three collections, The Hawk in the Rain, Lupercal and Rattlings, reset the tone of British poetry with inimitably devastating crunch. The forcibly authoritative voice, so in command of its subject it seemed like he was it. The stomp of a Hughes poem permits no counter-argument. The focus is unflinchingly exact. The osmotic resignation to existential tragedy so acute, the descriptive qualities at work so image-based they fume with visual intensity that Hughes immerses you in a poem like it's the last thing you'll ever read on earth. And that's how poems should be written, like they belong to the compressed space of your final hour as a prolonged adrenaline surge. Hughes's poems push out expansively into a universe in which there is no answers, only random galactic radio noise that originates outside the Earth's atmosphere as possibly the unsettled aftershock of the Big Bang. I'm writing this in the living room in Green's Court, Soho, 
perhaps the smallest cafe in London, a great reckoning in a small room, as Shakespeare referred to Marlowe's homicide, a murder he may well have helped instigate. I'm there to write and buy the street drugs I live on, benzodiazepines. Hughes shows up in the waiting like a giant. During their sojourn in rural Cashel Island in the late 60s, with Hughes booting up the ferocity of Crow, Asya observing from her first floor window the shed in which he wrote, expected, quote, the hut to smoke with the temperature of his presence in it. The temperature of his presence in it. It's Hughes's mining of psychic depths, the archetypal unfolding into its physical counterparts that places him into the heroic position of underworld voyager. In the poem Thrushes, the bird's instinctually polarised eye lays it to kill is counterposed against preoccupied human obsession. The thin divide between craft and madness collapsed into realised psychosis. I quote Ted, Though he bends to be blent in the prayer, how loud and above what furious spaces of fire do the distracting devils, orgy and hosanna, under what wilderness of black, silent, Waters weep. It's my belief you can't write poetry without encountering madness. Breakdowns are essentially built into the psychological type. If you go down, you can't come up. It's like the tube. Asio Wevel, in living with Hughes temporarily at Sylvia Plath's Fitzroy Road flat, in the months after Plath's suicide, has left us perhaps the only detailed account we have of Hughes's working methods by an eyewitness. As he describes how Hughes would sit sideways, cross-legged, against Plath's black desk that was too small for him, with a sandwich in one hand and a pen in the other. According to her, quote, his nostrils flared, his hair feathery, and leaping forward like a peacock's back train in reverse, swaying a little as he writes, rather like a great beast looking over an enormous feast, dazzled and confused by the variety. She goes on to tell us of his absolute concentration, his immunity to noise, and that, quote, he's almost incapable of performing one wrong word. She also divulges his refusal to share his work with her and his glowering, solid black moods that often accompanied his writing process. It was Asia rather than Plath noted Hughes' reliance on channeling, state-altering inspiration as his shaping resource of heightened reality, in which there is a perfect cooperation of right and left brain hemispheres in establishing a momentary solidarity with existence into which the poem fits. And while there's an arguable neural messaging between left and right brain hemispheres, the right side conditioning, imaginative creativity, and the left language and analytic methodology, the messenger infusing the two into a simultaneous response or the expanded awareness we call poetry is perhaps uncommon and given to very few. It seems to be the difference between imaginative poetry and its opposite reportage, which forms 80% of poetry, the efficiency and speed involved in imaginative perception leads to the sort of direct dissolve into metaphor or image. This is only partly received by poets lacking in deep subjectivity. The one realises the inexhaustible possibilities of being, the other simply relates objective reality as a sharing experience, Larkin's trash. 
And it wasn't only the urgent, overpowering call to create that Asya noted, but the spectator's involvement in the limits imposed on her by Hughes's ruthless devotion to work. Quote Asya, what insanity, what methodically crazy compulsion drove me to this nightmare maze of miserable, censorious, middle-aged furies with him and Sylvia, my predecessor, between our heads every night. And does Asya's self-realised poetic prose in expressing the turbulence of her relationship with Hughes fall short of plus? I would argue in many cases it is far superior. It's arguable in Hughes's mythology she became the sacrificial victim to his ritualised call. In Iggy's title song, Raw Power, he sings, Look in the eyes of a savage girl, fall deep in love in the underworld, raw power is sure to come running to you. And the retribution came back on Hughes like a gun exploded in his brain. And what's amazing about poetry is its unimpeachable survival in the individual, its resistance to being pathologized or having its autonomous resource infected or disabled by personal crisis, but instead often feeding on personal tragedy as regenerative subjects. It's the paradigm Hughes instructs through the indestructible resilience of his trickster crow, which converts obstacle into questionable gain. In the same way Hughes survived catastrophic atrocities in his private life through the continuity of writing as navigable exorcism. The poem takes you to a different place from where it started and you learn why along the way. And if you believe like me the future is already complete and we arrive at what has already happened, then the suicides in Hughes' life were occurrences intended to be rediscovered as integral to his destiny. His poetic exploration of the underworld. Nothing is randomised to me. What we've already done is what we experience now as Taurus back from the future. And in Hughes' unforgettable last standard of Peabrock, something of the inexplicable, unredemptive nature of our involvement with the universe is expressed in the aching emptiness of the galaxies. Quoting Ted, minute after minute, aeon after aeon, nothing lets up or develops, and this is neither a bad variant nor a tryout. This is where the staring angels go through. This is where all the stars bow down. This is where all the stars bow down. You can argue, what does a skinny, heroin-addicted, proto-punk pop star have to do with a serious poet like Ted Hughes and that only I would link the two together? To me, there's every reason for the analogy. In that literature, with its prestigious academic validation, takes itself far too seriously, to the point of being a retrovirus, whereas the notational aggro of Iggy's raw power collapses boundaries between emotion and language, perhaps closer in outrage to say how Asia may have felt about Hughes or Hughes Asia or Plas about both. Iggy's I Need Somebody of Raw Power carries the same mixed mess of human relations with a volatility that smacks. Well, I am your crazy driver. Honey, I'm sure to steer you wrong. I am dying in a story. I'm only living to sing this song. And after Plath's revenge or suicide, in part precipitated by the separation Hughes demanded, he too was only living to sing his song in a distraught domestic arena with Asia, the green-eyed feral beauty with classical elegance for whom he'd left Plath. 
and was now the target of a rage directed more at himself but turned on her as the target. A year after Plas's death, Asia wrote to Hughes, I am convinced you have maimed my life. You left me with nothing to salvage. The only revenge I can take on you is to go to bed with any attractive man who asks me to hurt your sensations out of my body, if not out of my mind or blood. Asia was responding to Hughes's serial sex addiction. addiction. His notorious voracious licentiousness, permitting no breaks on his sexual appetites. Hughes entered relationships, notably with Brenda Hedden, with the same creative, destructive agencies of nature that he so fully assimilated in his poetry. It's almost impossible to live with a totally committed poet, without the partner feeling, feeling excluded <coughs> and secondary to constant inner preoccupations that take precedence almost every other aspect of shared life. The absence of parallel processing, unless the partner has a strong sense of purposeful self-identity, is inevitably corrosive, and Hughes with his refusal to cook or engage in basic domesticities was at best difficult and at worst impossible. I am making this assessment with no right to judge. It's no more than a considered evaluation of what others claim to have experienced. Hughes's third collection, Recklings, published in January 1967 by Turret Books. The poems written at a low point in his life after Plath's suicide, is a much undervalued book that tends to go ignored and was never reprinted in his lifetime. As a book concerned with the exposition of personal sadness, Hughes called it a collection of bits and pieces which didn't seem to me to fit into what woe. But it's much more than that. Its assemblage of variables, perhaps dismissed by its author at the time on account of his despondent, unsettled, desperate mood and his argument with existence. There are outstanding successes in Recklings, like Plum Blossom, Stealing Trout on a May Morning and The Lake, an emergence throughout the beginnings of what was to become Crows and Hughes's recreation of the universe as a warring, malevolent pitch. In Plum Blossom, he compounds aspects of the continuing folk epic that was to dominate his writing for the rest of his life in terms of the primarily unredemptive, quote, inside the head of a cat, under the bones, the brains, the blood tissue, bone of the bone and brain of the brain, blood of the blood and tissue of the tissue is God's head with eyes open and under that my own head with wide eyes and under that the head of a bloody cat with eyes smiling and closed. Certainly no other British poet of Hughes's generation could touch the expansive courage of his conical vision travelling like a spacecraft through the unmapped dark of inner space. The lake from the same collection is as near perfect an imaginative realisation of animated nature as Hughes ever achieved with its armadillo skin surface, aware of itself alive, alive, and that humans, even a studied reflection, mean trespass in its own department of consciousness. The lake's indomitable push, push, push towards its own constricted escape is observed by Hughes as a conflict of demented opposing energies. Quote, Yet how the outlet fears it, dragging it out, black and yellow, a maniacal eel, battering it to death with sticks and stones, sticks and stones. Hughes's animism, encompassing the beliefs that all material phenomena have agency 
and the perceived things actively solicit our attention or call our focus with his dominant poetic principle and remained actively so right throughout his career as part of a story-based cosmology in which matter is alive and in possession of a distinct spiritual essence. Animism, rather than empathy with humans, was Hughes's decided attributes, and it was one that shocked his poetry into forcible attention. At a time when British poetry was downsizing into constriction, Hughes arrived with the apparent spirit command of a shaman to emanate his belief that sentience exists not only in humans, but in all the components of nature as a holistic organism. In Beech Tree from Recklings, he again identifies the tree as independent of passive in our direct experience, quote, and like an old moss hunter sucking the bones of all speculation, on its leashes fly owls and astronomers' skulls. This pantheistic accrediting of matured awareness instructing the tree is a very different operation to describing its natural characteristic common to left-brained poets, who I hate, with only limited access to the right. It's this facility gives Hughes an almost tribally savage authority over an animalistic domain of lawlessness that shakes all safe boundaries within which most popular poetry is contained. It seems to me, hmm, me, that despite the catastrophic turbulence of his personal life, Hughes's real greatness of unparalleled originality as a poet is most specifically timelined from the publication of his first book, The Hawk and the Rain, 1957, to the seminally warlord avatar, Crow, 1970, a period in which Hughes's creatively manipulated an often terrifying self-mythology into recognition with the external world. The psychic commerce entailed in this often destabilizing process of poetic authority that may, in happening, override every other principle in life, cost lives in Hughes's case, before more fully reintegrating as a person from the descent into psychological chaos. What we may call an apprenticeship in darkness is often the first stage of a poet's emergence and how deep he or she is prepared to go as a traveller in counting automatisms, archaic ideation and transpersonal forms is dependent on individual sensibility. We could additionally argue that poetry in the way Hughes literally embodies it, that's the only way it embodies it, is a recuperation from deep psychic processes experienced in the archetypal underworld, reinterpreted through the autonomous organisation of language, the moody aloneness of the self-harming teenager Avoiding both parents and friends may be indicative of the first states of poetic rights to a responsive nervous system. Hughes's poem, Meeting, from his first collection, The Hawk and the Rain, describes something of the initiatory testing of darkness involved in the fragile boundaries between madness and poetry with altogether shocking clarity in their allegorised meeting. You can't get closer to the symbiosis of the engagement of shaman and imaginative realisation than the black goat on a mountain ledge opposing the poet in his menacing pathway towards transforming realities. The black goat looks, stares the adventurer down into a shocked halt that he is in fact being scrutinised 
by a warning double, quoting Ted, a square, pupiled, yellow-eyed look. The black devil head against the blue air, what gigantic fingers took him up and on a bare palm turned him close under an eye that was like a living, hanging hemisphere and watched his blood gleam with a ray slow and cold and ferocious as a star till the goat clattered away. The poem expresses the return of the primal, the unstoppable rip of raw power retrievably accessible to Hughes at a time of small mapping in British poetry. Put into pop referentials, it's what the Velvet Underground, the Stooges and MC5 were doing as garage prototypes of the period, as the precursors liberating punk into the deconstructive shattering of pop as commodified industry. If Hughes's second collection, Lupercal, finds him most perfectly in command of his core animism, animism, then it's in part because subject and the brain activities involved in creating it often form a corresponding interface in describing the function of a tree-roosting hawk in the stripped-down brilliance of hawk-roosting, Hughes is also deliberating on his method, so poet and bird occupy the same shared space. Quote, I sit in the top of the wood, my eyes closed. In action, no falsifying dream between my hooked head and hooked feet, or in sleep rehearse perfect kills and eat. One closes one's eyes in order to go deeper into psychic space when writing, and the measured inaction or state of quasi-trance often perhaps helps mine the associative state between emergent imageries in the way that a hawk's resting point increases, increases its alertness to kill. In this way, the shaping idea enters the awareness of both poet and bird as the closest core we can get to understanding the relationship between language and existence. Hughes expresses the quality of these convergent states when discussing Shakespeare's conversion of apprehension into spontaneous activity as, quote, he raises the idea into quasi-physical reality, then lets his feeling respond to it exactly as if it were real. That observation alone coming from deep contemplative introspection about the neuro processes involved in framing poetry says everything about Shakespeare that we need ever know. That one line tells you everything. It's that simple if you have the facility, whether you're drunk, ruined, drugged, hopeless, it's always there and accessible to process. In the way of Hughes, Shakespeare wrote oblivious to disruption or the irate haranguing of a wife demanding the attention he couldn't give. He drank himself blind and probably didn't bother with his dinner, eating it rapidly when left alone. Anyhow, he preferred boys. <laughs> Sorry for the humour. <laughs> what Hughes accentuates in Lupercal is the centralised position of the poet in the poem. He is direct centre, rather than peripheral in the case of more objective poets dissociated from the work and essentially detached into description. In the same way a lot of singers fail convincingly to enter the song, their phrasing suggesting lack of emotional contact with the lyrics and vocal 
technique as a substitute. Hughes, on the contrary, uh -huh, gets under the skin of his subject like taking it captive and recruiting it for his own. And this isn't necessarily a romantic concept of centralized subjectivity. It's more dominance of liquid empathy empowering the exchange. It's there in many of the great poems that enhance Lupercal as a collection, pikes, thrushes, and otter, hawk rooting, November, etc., where Hughes's characteristic dissolve hijacks the intelligence of his subject. And it's the inestimable depths of Hughes's mythopoetics allows this to happen. And of the kind he describes fishing a lake for pike as he might his unconscious to connect patterns of imagery. Quote, stilled, legendary depths. It was as deep as England. It held pike too immense to stir. So immense and old that past nightfall I dared not cast, but silently cast them, fished with the hair frozen on my head. For what might move, move, move? For what I might move, the still splashes on the dark ponds, owls hushing the floating woods, Frail on my ear against the dream darkness beneath night's darkness had freed that rose mm, slowly towards me, watching, watching, watching. When you're down that deep into things, it's like the premonition of madness. Once on the edge of a precipitant breakdown, I recall looking out at tall sunflowers in the garden that turned into malevolent, red-faced giants, all synchronistically turned on me with their threat and simultaneously feeling collapsed into interior depths that swallowed me. Hughes's output was monumental and that he never deviated from the inexorable call of poetry as romantic totality. At a time when most poets were systemized into conventional employment, placing the material safety of a career above the hazardous but thrillingly adventurous quest of making poetry a singular command. And if you've really got it bad, and I mean poetry is a naggingly aggressive addiction, you can't get off because the compromise kills. Part of Sylvia Plath's encyclopedic list of complaints about Hughes, documented in her regular self-therapeutic letters to Dr. Boucher, her one-time psychiatrist, was Hughes's impracticality. Quote Sylvia, he has never paid a bill. Always, always, da, 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 louses up the checkbooks at the times I've asked him to take that over, so I'll have to make it right, and there's no idea of yearly rates, taxes, bills. And of course the answer is, why should he, when his dominant engagement with poetry was like being sucked into a parallel existence, and his sexual motivations those of Dionysian polygamy. And throughout her letters and journals, one wonders, as a poet given to hysteric and depressive disorders, Plath should expect Hughes of all people to subscribe to normal. Who cares a fuck about bills when you have poetry to write that is pushing its boundaries out into the cosmos? Anyone living with Hughes's propulsive, monomaniacal drive towards creativity would have been living in the shadow of a mountain, and it's indicative the plus speed rush of agonizingly confessional and celebratory poems that constitute Ariel were written alone at Cork Green Devon in the late summer and autumn of 1962 when Hughes had separated from her and was living with Asia in London. Plus voluble unilateral diatribe of hatred directed against Hughes 
in her letters, another sort of raw power, displays a complete lack of self-reflection on her part as to her hysterical behaviour, behavioural input into marital implosion. Raw power again uses personification of the primal turbo of a jaguar's black predatory muscle is better caught in second glance at a jaguar in Wadwo 1967 as a ferociously insightful advance on his first instinctual autopsy of a jaguar in Hawk in the Rain. It's evidence again of Hughes' ability to become subject rather than poet in the course of operatively writing with the incisive precision of a neurosurgeon stroke. At every stride, he has to turn a corner in himself and correct it. His head is like the worn-down stump of another whole jaguar. His body is just the engine shoving it forwards, lifting the air up and shoving on under, the weight of his fangs hanging the mouth open, bottom jaw combing the ground. The phenomenology of Hughes's transpersonal experiences in poetry are so profoundly reorganising and empathising with alternate states of consciousness that he opens up possibilities of how sentient creatures experience awareness of a world they share with us, despite separation. This faculty is so individual to him that it provides an indefensible weaponry of poetic assault, but accented in his first decade of writing when his focus correlated with creatures rather than people, some of them closely observed when Hughes was working as a night watchman at Regent's Park Zoo, and others drawn from his rural upbringing in Miss Morrell, South Yorkshire. It was, of course, this phenomenal centre of the tribal that took Hughes to live at North Taunton for the last three decades of life, to root with the mythopoetic and reopen negotiations with what Hughes conceived as the innate power of animistic myths as the resources of his poetry. If his work doesn't appear to expand, but only deepen, it's because Hughes was essentially an underworld journeyer, prepared to encounter and learn from the darkest irrational motives archetypally programmed into the psyche. Reading a Hughes poem can be a bit like confronting a psycho on the tube who is already fixed on you. His murderously psychotic intentions given expression by his rolling eyes. I experienced that once on the Piccadilly line and quickly exiting at Leicester Square against my antagonist's medicated impediment of speed jumped straight into a yellow-lit taxi welcomely stalled at a red light outside the station exit. With Hughes, one has the barrier of words, but the implied impulse of much of Crow manifests the same sort of psychopathologies. In his Shakespeare and the Goddess, arguably the greatest book ever written on poetry, Hughes importantly refers to madness as a, quote, as a new, bottomless resource. And for Shakespeare, quote, an infinite new field of operations, confirming my own lifelong conviction that the sort of poetry that breaks down doors into new dimensions is of necessity infected by a modified madness, a pinching out of recognisable frontiers into the previously undiscovered. Hughes wrote opposite the contemporary's condition to affirm what is already there, who wants it, what I call the careerist mode, to smack the reader hard in what they promised he always feared to know. And that's one purpose of poetry, the exploration of high weirdness, like journeying to tomorrow 
and coming out today. I'm interested in what writers do while writing and the processes of adrenalized clarity maintained or distractive while constructing work. If I'm at home, I listen to rock music. It's stimulating, additive to my inspired work bang. If I'm out, I talk to weirdos in cafes who fixate on my handwriting. But what did Ted do? Drink and drink and drink and walk out in a blaze across farmland, cursing everything under a grey, lowering sky or shamanically packed through the agencies he recognised as spirit guides. According to Asia Wevel, whose detailed observations of hues documented in black ink in her diary, less maliciously abrasive than plus ripping assault in letters, the left hand side of Hughes's face looked younger than the right, and she saw him in the asymmetrical constituents of at least four different men. She noted, quote, his mouth is grim, it's a sand ditch, and that the saturation of his black moods, black moods, when he sometimes couldn't write, provoked immediate destruction and a total irresponsiveness in him, supported by an exemption from her needs and inquiries as, quote, I'm done, as a way of shutting down. It's back to Iggy Pop's, quote, I am the world's forgotten boy, the one who searches and destroys. Asia also noted the wild demonic hysteria in Hughes's dream topography of encounters with Plus, and how in one dream her hair had turned white, and that he shot a cat they had in Boston, but it refused to die. In another disturbing dream encounter with Plath, he recorded he had, quote, a terrible grief dream about Sylvia, long and unending, in a house large stone on the moor's edge. The garden was also a cemetery, unquote. It was with this churning, oneric subtext of submerged guilt that Hughes began intimately writing the ferocious butchery of Crow as a questing assault on man's undecidable place in the universe, while claiming that Crow's evolution, quote, gradually develops some purpose in life, which becomes a quest to find who created him. Hughes also noted the ambivalent characteristic that, quote, he's forever, through one clue and another, approaching his creator. And when he gets there, it always turns out that it's some female or other. If Crow reads like a series of psychic genocides fired by atavistic mythologies, then it also finds its counterpoint in the serial atrocities of modern warfare as its physical basics. The night before his marriage to Plath, Hughes dreamt that he hooked a huge pike, and when the fish began to surface, its head filled the entire lake. In the same way, we can read his later personification of Crow as a black sun eclipsing the universe. A maniacal aggressor dragged out of primal domain to execute final vengeance like nuclear meltdown. But before Crow, there was Wodwo, 1967. Drawn variously from poetry, written during the time he spent with Clarks at Chalcot Square in 63, and much of it during sojourns at Cork Green, when ostensibly Hughes was supporting himself by writing for children, as well as the need to write plays and stories for BBC broadcasts as an essential form of income. The poems in Wadwo and in particular the superbly elusive title poem, deepened Hughes's myth-making and myth-mapping, into nature being fully aware both of its cooperation in and independence of man's efforts. What woe is an invisible entity is drawn to the river searching for a reflective identity. 
rather than being pure consciousness in quasi-mythological suspension. Again, Hughes's shamanic inventiveness goes beyond his contemporaries into a self-definitive Hughes land that permits no trespasses. Quote from what woe, what am I? Nosing here, turning leaves over, following a faint stain on the air to the river's edge, I enter water. What am I to split the glassy grain of water? Looking upward, I see the bed as a river above me, upside down, very clear. What am I doing here in mid-air?" Imagination doesn't require answers. It's an extended, permeable totality that you can pinch into a chewing gum stretch, whereas formal left brain poets demand that poems resolve into meaning. A meaning of what? Certainly nothing that interests me. Imagination is without resolution, and your own contact with it allows you to reinvent and personalise the experience rather than contriving a factual stoppage like a blocked artery, i.e. Larkin. You can sense I hate that man and all of his followers, motion and all that trash. Like all totally committed poets, financial anxiety was a constant, and often plus and after plus suicide, and never really having wanted children, he found his responsibilities as a parent extending to Nicholas, Frida and Shura, the child he had with Asia in March 1965, without ever overtly claiming fatherhood. And how are essentially right brain of poets expected to exist? as a particular exacting, inexorably addictive call when left-brainers desert poetry for the material safety of secondary jobs. In other words, conceding to normal children the mortgage and the deployment of an institutionalised work ethic. How lucky I am I haven't. It's not without significance that Asia gifted Hughes in December 1966 with the rare 1880 edition of Alexander Gilchrist's seminal Life of William Blake and with the OUP edition of Valor or the Four Zoas in which Blake established his own uniquely disruptive mythology of apocalyptically conflicting cosmogenics without apologies or explanations of his invented symbolism. You can't with or without them enter into other people's lives or relationships, or judge intrinsic values from an external position. But there's something so maliciously venomous about class rebound that you find neither in or Asia. Quote from Asia, I laugh in my guts when I think of them married. They look exactly alike, the same colour, shape, everything. She is his twin sister, and like his sister, barren, uncreative, a real vamp. All sophistication. They smoke. Ted, a non-smoker, has been de desperately practising. <clears throat> Can't read that with the opposite sex to titillate each other. They will be elaborately unfaithful to each other. Very rich and have no children. If her two abortions and four miscarriages can let me have this, this satisfaction. To Plas, Asia was, quote, a barrency ad agency writer who commands a huge salary and puts it all on her back. Hmm. There's something of a bit of paradox in all of this and that Plas published correspondence and journals amount to 4,000 pages, downsizing her poetic output to disproportionately minimal no matter the incontrovertible brilliance of the aerial poems. Hughes worked a lot harder at poetry, and what woe, despite sharing poems with short stories in a radio play, is a major distillation of his irrepressibly renewable talent. 
Wardrobe provides inimitable successes like Thistles, Cadenza, Second Last at a Jaguar, Skylarks, You Drive in a Circle, P. Brock, Full Moon and Little Frida, and not least the title poem, What Woe. Of all these poems, of all these poems succeed in evincing that poetry is the means of experience as well as being the experience itself and that the natural dimensionality of poetry is to introduce the reader to an unfamiliar state of consciousness. My favourite from Wadwo is Cadenza, a turbulent mini-cyclone of imagery fueled to shattering. The poem's unstoppable momentum is experienced like a pilot ditching the nose cone into a mountain face. Quote, the clouds are full of surgery and collision, but the coffin escapes as a black diamond, a ruby brimming blood and emerald beating its shores. The sea lifts swallows wings and flings a summer lake open, spins and bewilders its reflection to the whole sky dive shut like a burned land back to its spark. <laughs> Nobody else could have written that. This is Hughes' raw power, raw power, ramped up to optimal with ravagingly lapidary imagery, brimming with colours bled from source, and its audiovisual too with an emerald beating its shores, as though a green ocean is contained in the stone. What woe, as a transitional collection, rewards with a searing, shape-shifting originality in which the roughage of Hughes's Saxon diction rounds into sensuality, arcs into a sweep and hints at the emergent themes of Crow in which, abandoning all artifice, Hughes sets about disemboweling his own poems with his bare hands. Who can forget thistles in their continuously undefeatable resurgence? Quote, everyone a revengeful burst of resurrection. A class fistful of splintered weapons, an Icelandic frost thrust up from the underground stain of a decayed Viking. Raw power in Hughes's timeline. And I'm also thinking of Black Sabbath's iconic heavy metal album Paranoid from 1970, a record signature by Tony Lamy's aviational guitar riffs, drilling existence back a mile with every chord. At the same time as Hughes is publishing his enduring children's book, The Iron Man, so too Black Sabbaths recorded their own Iron Man, a slice of apocalyptic time travel in which the voyager, in the process of returning to the present, is turned into steel by a magnetic field and unable to communicate his findings, turns on humanity with catastrophic vengeance. It's definitely Hughes' territory, even though, though it's improbable there's any overlap or that either artist was aware of the other's similar quest. While it's the guitar riff goes sonically stratospheric and aggressive incremental firepower, the lyric exploring the dumb state of a psycho is leaning towards similar in Crow. Quote, Has he lost his mind? Can he see or is he blind? Can he walk at all? Or if he moves, will he fall? Is he alive or dead? It is an amazing phenomenon that both Hughes and Plath seem to have been totally blocked to the existence of rock music as the most influentially generational vector of times they lived through with Hughes's preference always remaining classical and missing out on the shamanic components of the rock hero as tribal apotheosis and the liberating dynamic of sexualized energies it emitted. For Asia, 
not too long to go for Asya, accompanying Hughes on his psychic pathway into Crow. She was forced to live with Hughes's parents at Cork Green, both of whom refused to acknowledge or speak to her, and in a household redolent of plus, and in Asya's words, quote, a strong sensation of her repugnant live presence, alienated and excluded by Hughes's locked for hours in his writing hut, an emerging like re-entry from the dissociative pull of inner space, she began to contemplate suicide with the underlying belief that Hughes would never support class suicide and that she was in part to blame. In 1967, Asya returned to live and work in London, moving into a flat 14 at Marlborough Place, St John's Wood, and working for the Overby Agency, while Hughes's poetic strain was persistently disrupted by looking after his chronically ill mother and equally depressed father. Returning to Cork Green in 1968, her sense of humiliation and despair tunnelled in due to Hughes's inflexible routines and dislike of any attempted rearrangement to the layout of his house, and in addition, she had been fired from her agency job. Again, separating geographically from Hughes, Asia took over the lease of a flat in Oakover Manor in the north side of Clapham Common, while Hughes at Cork Green forced an entry into the incohate darknesses of the epic he conceived as Crow, originally intended to incorporate prose and poetry as a monumental construct he never satisfactorily succeeded in completing. Even when Crow was published in 1970, the book omitted a wide scattering of Crow's poems already published in limited editions and in magazines and seemingly discarded. What is Crow? The partially conceived epic that Hughes identified as his poetic legacy? Is it a black avatar of butchered self-loathing in which the artophardic poet cannibalizes his own experiences in the making of the poem into nihilistic degradation? Is it the internalized representation of Hughes into predatory sexual trickster accounting for suicides at the cost of his using bodies like meat? Is it the demythicization of religio myth into its opposite, the existential nadir? Is it the demolition of his own earlier writing mythologies into an apparent nuclear fallout of metaphor, a surreal catastrophe? Is it a black hex in which the incantations pull short of the feature? Is it end times germinated by a psychotic database? Is it the deliberation of millennia finally realised as brain-bashing atrocity, the sum of everything we imagine about the barbarity of the past and the nuclear warheads of the future? Is it an insertion into the primordial intelligence of creatures raided by Hughes and translated into the present? There aren't any answers to visionary poetics. Only that the poem's manic assault succeeds in smashing the lock in generation through the front teeth. If what was indicative of Hughes's expansive experimentation, then Crow was his delivery. The annihilative poetry is so independent in its operation that it owes nothing to the British underground or to the American postmodernism spearhead by John Ashbury as the liberating movements of the period. It so adamantly, obstinately hues, both in its conception and in its piling on of remorseless violence, that the power of the writing exceeds its boundaries, like, quote, the man smashing everything he could reach and had strength to smash before he went beyond his own body, unquote. That may have been Hughes's ugly, compulsive mood at the time of writing an intended epic, 
that is like a black litany to death as an active rather than passive state. In support of his personalised black beast as indestructible avenger, Hughes's argument extends to creation as a conjectural sick joke. In the poem, A Horrible Religious Error, the emergent serpent of biblical myths and the embodiment of evil terrifies all creation except Crow. Quote, but Crow only peered and took a step or two forward, grabbed this creature by the slack skin nate, beat the hell out of it and ate it. Steeped in folklore, alchemy, shamanism and the occult, Hughes, by way of exposition of his black trickster, conceded, quote, Crow is another word for the entrails, lungs, heart, etc., everything extracted from a beast when it is gutted. What is extracted when this is done is the vital organism of the creature, lacking only the brain and nerves. The crow of a man, in other words, is the essential man, only minus his human-looking vehicle, his bones and muscles, unquote. However one aspects crow, the poem's impacting velocity continues to tear into the fabric of the future. Whatever its constituents of eviscerated myths bled into the tech of modern genocides and oligarchical autocracies, Crow remains the supreme documentation of the defiantly triumphant anti-hero in an arena in which, quote, reality was given its lesson, its mishmash of scripture and physics, with here brains in hands, for example, and there legs in treetops. Hughes wrote Crow against the menacing undertow of parallel relationships conflicting with his equivocal commitment to Asia whose inner resources to a part-time affair were starting to run out. Although still provocatively beautiful at 42, Asia had most probably been configuring her suicide as the second enactment of Plus for a long time preparatory to the act. Like Plus, she died in a sealed kitchen the gas taps full on, and according to her neighbour, Miss Jones, who discovered, who discovered her lying on some blankets on the floor on her left side, and her daughter was lying on her back, with her in face inclined towards her mother. Hughes, who was a court green, was the next day summoned by police knocking on his door to report immediately to Southwark Mortuary, London. The police were led to him by Asia, having left a stamped envelope addressed to him on her bedside table to identify the two bodies. In her will, Asia left Hill, left Hughes, quote, My no doubt welcome accent and my always bitter contempt. Smashed, disconsolate, and with his life again in personal ruin, Hughes abandoned work on his heroically imagined epic and published Crow the following year in 1970 as a fractured portion of the intended whole. He told Brenda Hedden that he needed to omit his obsessive saturation with the words death and black as an unmitigating mantra repeatedly scorch invoked in Crow from future works and move on into another attempted reintegration. How and where you deposit grief is an entirely personal issue and poetry does little or nothing to repair it. Rather it pushes you back into it rather than out. Hughes kept his grief private, his psychological scars submerged, not publishing birthday letters, his poems addressed the plus until the year of his death, 1998, and choosing to publish his poems for Asia Capriccio as a limited edition from the Gehenna Press in 1990. And my own life, 
The suicides of friends started very early, either from the unmanageability of life's demands, drug abuse and dependencies, or the despair that comes of depressed disorders. I've written deeply personal elegies for most of the dead in my life, and of course the experience of the poem is unshared by the recipient. At best, it's a token for the family or friends as beneficiaries, and of course it costs pain, retrieving what you do from associated memories and attempting to compress the salient characteristics of a person into words that fit with aspects of their personality. It's invariably a flawed remake, a scattered offering. Nobody knows what I do at the living room other than they express wonder at the consistency of my handwriting and how could I tell them the unlocatable zones of inner space I'm travelling through because I don't know myself. In this case, I'm trying to make a small entry point into the gigantic carcass of Ted Hughes's remains, his poetry, or what he called the crow, the essence that outlives the body and continues, in his case, to glow. Thank you. invited Mikey Fitzpatrick to sing a song from his album Crow. Before we finish. There was this man and he was the strongest of the strong. He gritted his teeth like a cliff Though his body was sweeping away Like a torrent on a cliff Smoking towards dark gorges There he nailed himself With nails of nothing All the women of the world could not move him. They came, their mouths deformed against stone. They came and their tears salted his nail holes, only adding their embitterment to his effort. He abandoned his grin to them, his grimace. With his face upward body, he lay face downwards, as a dead man adamant. His sandals would not move him. They burst their thongs and rotted from his fixture. All the men of the world could not move him. They wore at him with their shadows and little sounds. Their arguments were a relief Like heather flowers His belt would not endure the siege It burst And lay broken He grinned Little children came in chorus to move him But he glanced at them Out of his eye corners Over the edge of his grin they lost their courage for life. Oak forests came and went with the hawk wing. Mountains rose and fell. He lay crucified on all the earth. And he grinned through the strings of his lips and the bones of his teeth. In his senseless trial of strength, in his senseless trial of strength, in his senseless trial of strength, 
in a senseless trial of strength. You can, before grabbing it at lows, you can ask me any questions you want, right in the not too personal. You can ask me anything about the talk I've just given. If you feel like it. We've got time for just Come. maybe two questions. Okay. Would anyone yeah. like to ask? And I do have to thank Jeremy for one of the most exciting lectures that even he has given us and for the way that he channeled the energy of Hughes. Very full, very inspiring. Do we have any questions? For Jeremy. Um, yeah. Do you remember discussing uh, Ted Hughes with Kathleen Ray at I do immensely, yeah. yeah. Kathleen always claimed Ted couldn't write about people but wrote brilliantly about nature and therefore she kind of downgraded him into not a great poet because she felt he didn't empathise with humans. Yeah. Um, but she had respect, of course, for the way he looked at nature. I helped convince her that he was absolutely fantastic. Um, but later in life, yeah, she, she saw it, but the ferocity and the violence perhaps made her feel a little yeah. bit uncomfortable um, because she saw nature mystically, he saw a true nature, and I think that was their slight, slight difference. But she loved his book, Shakespeare and the Goddess. She bought me a copy as soon as it came out and said to me, read it, it's the best book on poetry ever written. And it simply is. If, anybody, if you want to know how poetry is written, read Ted Hughes's Shakespeare and the Great Goddess of Being. Nobody has ever come closer to the nerves of what it creates to write. Thank you very much, thank Chris. Anybody like to ask a last question? Maybe that's the moment to conclude. I think you've, you've said it all. Yeah, you could. You know, I'm a proponent only of the imaginative and anti the careerist, which is 99% of poets. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Um, and do, do engage in conversation, but not for too long. Yes. <laughs> thank we, you. We can so talk on our way. Well, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> welcome to the Royal Asiatic Society, and still more welcome to the Temenos Academy. Um, one of the moments I always look forward to in the autumn is the opportunity to introduce Jeremy Reed and one of his wonderful talks, lectures, performances, readings a facet of all of those, um, choose what you will. Um, in the last couple of years, I've um, been working on Jeremy's poetry and I have read at least 50 volumes of his poems, dating from the 1960s up to the present day. And <clears throat> the experience has strengthened my view that Jeremy is probably the most important poet of my generation. Um, often overlooked, sometimes vilified, but nonetheless um, he has a body of work which is unmatched, I think, in, in my generation and in this country. So um, it's always a great delight to introduce him. He's one of those poets who should be read by other poets as well as by general readers. And Jeremy is also one of the earliest members of the publishing group which surrounded and contributed to the original Temenos journal. Um, he was a close friend of Kathleen's and a fellow poet. Um, and so it's particularly exciting and I'm particularly delighted that Jeremy has agreed to give us a talk about his friendship with Kathleen Wayne. Um, which I think will give us a tremendous insight into one of the key points of creativity in the second half of the 20th century. So I'm delighted to introduce Jeremy, who's going to speak on the Poets Thank Academy you, at 47 Paulton Square 
personal friendship with Kathleen Ray and Jeremy Reed. Thank you very much. To meet Kathleen Rain, I was first confronted by a lion's head, the slightly oxidised brass door knocker <laughs> featured on the aluminium painted door to 47 Porton Square. The significance of this imposing solar guardian, I was to learn later, characteristically imported from Blake, dictum, the wrath of the lion is the wisdom of God. The simmering July heat mixed with an edgy quotient of whiffy white noise off the King's Road consolidated my nervousness. Standing in this Georgian terrace garden square in Chelsea, a thrown look from world's end as punk attractor, and at last at the smudged card strip on the door annunciator simply read Madge without Kathleen preceding it. I was there, eyes pitted with black eyeliner, relatively new to London, through the intermediary of David Gascoigne, who'd sent Kathleen my poems, soon after the beginnings of our close friendship, optimally enhanced by our shared belief in Andre Breton's pioneering iconoclastic pointer, poetry in the service of the revolution. David, who hadn't published a book for 25 years, was contemporaneous with emerging from a black, solid mass of depression and episodic memory loss due to electroconvulsive shock starting to be rediscovered, not only as an urban visionary, but for the seminal role he had played in the first wave of 1930s surrealism, in which uncensored imaginative autonomy pushed hard to subvert formal modes of literary expression. When the door opened, a dark-suited Kathleen, a single brooch as accessory, her blue eyes liquid with twinkling catchlights, I knew her to be in her early 70s, stood back momentarily, taking me in with her inhalation, and said carefully to me, Yes, Jeremy, real poets are always beautiful. Do come in. I went into a green hall dominated by Cecil Collins's artwork. I didn't know, she told me. And straight into a kitchen, heady, resinous and tangy with the rum-drenched, currant-eyed fruitcake she bake for my visit and asked me to choose a tea from a line of chunky tin canisters and being me, I selected much to her approval the pine smoky tannins of Lapsang Souchong. By the kitchen door, open on a sunken garden, there was a box of jet black pansies, true black rather than purple, a tip to her scientific knowledge of botany as something lived and known as the organic extension of her core mysticism. What am I inventing by remembering, or remembering by inventing, and how do I recognise the dissolve? I was there, and I'm writing this now. And I can't run time backwards, only resituate events in the present, as though I can physically place Kathleen's 160 pounds seated in a lived-in, partially shabby green armchair in front of you as she sat facing me in July circa 1981, but I did sit facing her. The time travelled lemony sunshine filtering through with photonic clarity. I had a notebook with me, <clears throat> by which I mean I'm mobile. I write anywhere and everywhere, in cafes, in buses, planes, on the street, in public spaces, walking. I mean it's always there, the language I need to make poetry. And Kathleen there as I describe her, and she was naturally curious about what I was writing and asked me if I would read her some new poems. What I have with me as work in progress was a section of my first novel, The Lipstick Boys, a fictionalised assemblage of my deeply traumatised teens in Jersey, in which I was socially outlawed for my pop star looks and disaffection from normal and in the process sent from one dumb dystopian psychiatrist to another, sampling anti-anxiety drugs that made me weirder. As an antidote to toxic psychiatry, I played Lou, Reco Lou Reed records very loud and immersed myself in the imploded 
cut-up of Burroughs's naked lunch. I stalled on reading it, telling Kathleen the contents were too personally disturbing and in need of revision, but she insisted I go ahead, qualifying extreme psychology as integral to visionary poetics. My descriptive passages of marine atmospheric sea fog aqueously colliding with rainbow halos led into descriptions of an older gay man, Nifty Jim, being brutally gang-beaten for wearing red lipstick and to other same-sex persecutions, at which I noticed Kathleen was discreetly extinguishing tears. And when I stopped reading, she was adamant she was not only going to find a publisher for the book, but introduce it. She immediately called her friend Alan Clodd, who had published a number of her books, and David Gascoigne's from Enotharman Press, and told Alan not only that he was going to publish it, but that she would supply an introduction, as she liked the idea of risk in supporting my subculture. As the afternoon deepened rather than progressed, Kathleen spoke of the Androgyne as the archetype most conducive to imaginative creativity and how, in accordance with her belief in the perennial philosophy, she'd largely renounced the heteronormative world for the intellectual refinement of gay men, the likes of Rupert Doom, Francis Bacon, Patrick White, David Gascoigne, Robert Duncan, Gavin Maxwell, James Merrill, etc., all of whom contributed significantly to her psychic diagram of altered sexuality as integrated into the Jungian concept of the mandala telling me too, and much later in our friendship, that she too felt she inhabited bisexual consciousness as an aspect of her psyche. She'd left two husbands, Hugh Sykes Davis and Charles Madge, committed her two children, James and Anna, to the care of her friend and patron, Helen Sutherland, and totally liberated herself into the pursuit of poetry, collateral to her self-appointed post, as she called it, secretary to William Blake. What more can you offer? The romantic quest of poetry as quantum unifier or the quotidian banality of raising children? There is only one option, poetry. The penumbral guilt of deserting her children that ate into Kathleen's nerves later in life was a persistent, wrung-out obsession that we went over and over together in the attempt to lessen her irrational sense of guilt at letting her children down in ways that became an augmented, inventive fiction. Kathy was vociferously anti-feminist, and while personally abdicating the role of mother and forming what she called a spiritual family of friends, she insisted on woman's role being domestic and not creative, arguing that woman genetically had failed to create poetry comparable in her estimates to her male archetypal heroes, Dante, Shakespeare, Blake, Shelley, and her contemporary ideals like St. John Perth, David Jones, and David Gascoigne. She considered woman inferior in biochemical aspects of creativity, arguing that the optimal qualities of femininity would be, were to be discovered in the male androgyne, who was more adept at exploiting the duality than his female counterpart, her masculine aspect. Her profound studies of Plotinus, and she insisted on giving me a beautiful green and gilt edition of his treatise on beauty, the alchemically based psychology of C.G. Jung, Burma, Blake, and the whole mystic genealogy right up to Crowley, Corbin, and James Hillman, consolidated her thesis that male androgyny, Proust of course included, was the bronchial plexus that motivated creative autonomy. Seeing in me an addition to her claimed genealogy, she insisted soon after we met I read all of Proust as confirmation of my own self-identity, and was sometimes visit Peter Jones, the retail outlet at nearby Sloan Square, and by me sense I had come to personalise, like Gelin's Le Bleu and the tropical grass-saturated vetiver, admiring like me its maker, Jacques Gelin's aesthetic Japanophilia, expressed in the subtle character of Mitsuku, in which the girl's tragic personality is the genie in the sense. 
Kathleen herself used a scent from Imar's door, the woman's clothes shop in Palm Place, Chelsea, where she bought XL dresses and suits, usually accompanied by her close friend, Setters Blacker. While Kathleen's schematic for the androgyne, nominalising the adjective androgynous, was derived formatively from Plato's Symposium, in which homosexuality is correspondingly idealised as a Socratic component of androgyny, I was able, without resistance on her part, to introduce contemporary pop looks as a continuity of the state into her awareness, the likes of Mick Jagger, David Bowie, Michael Jackson and Annie Lennox, in which masculine and feminine characteristics provided an extended culture of gender ambiguity. She herself remarked to me often and enthusiastically on the lurid cerise, turquoise, flamingo, emerald, scarlet, punk, hairdo she regularly saw when out shopping on the King's Road, particularly at Waitrose, her preferred, preferred supermarket. One afternoon when I visited her, and a rare day on which she'd actually been paid for something, she told me she'd given a wad of cash to a junkie in a doorway, telling me she thought it was better to live in altered state reality than in the corporate system she so despised, quoting Blake, quote, those who do not have light in their face shall never become stars. Nobody had better integrated the molecular exhaust of Blake's prophetic writings than Kathleen Rain, both in the ga galaxy of its inner pathways, but also through the architectonics of London, the city in which Blake lived and out of which he built the import of his post-apocalyptic realities, the great seething whirl of plasma he called, quote, a fortuitous concourse of memories accumulated and lost. There was no doubt in Kathleen's mind or in mine, again utilising Blake, quote, the imagination is not a state, it is the human existence itself. When we first met, she'd been advised to slow down on account of a tired heart, a diagnosis she was to refute by engaging in relentlessly active work for another two decades using homeopathy dosed Hawthorne as a natural vasodilator and whiskey to promote circulation. She'd already fired all of the three initially contributing editors to Temenos in order to assert singular control over the contents, never compromised in anything she did, and objected with impassioned defiance to any opposition to her literary beliefs. She created enemies in the same way that she attracted friends, caring nothing for the consequences, and asking me on my visits to read through poetry submitted to Temenos. I was told to bin contributions by woman and generally discard most submissions as substandard. Ted Hughes's poems were rejected with a long accompanying letter by Kathleen, arguing that he was unable to personalise humans without converting them shamanically into animals, and that he failed her poetic criterion on these grounds. Geoffrey Hill's poems were similarly thrown out as spurious for what she called, quote, religious rather than visionary impulse. And my attempts to argue a case for Tom Gunn was flattened by her dismissal of adolescent themes for biker boys. While she willingly published Robert Duncan, Allen Ginsberg and Gary Snyder, my appeal for John Ashbury met with a rejection of unfocused Disneyland. And once Kathleen began drinking at 5.30, often forwarded to 5 on my visits, drink being unmeasured tumblers of scotch diluted fractionally with mineral water, her denigration of most existing reputations in literature was habitual practice of downsizing individuals she thought detrimental to her personal view of a psychological type she insisted to be representative of poetry. Kathleen, like most drinkers, serious drinkers, liked both the excitatory and sedative effects of alcohol on the brain's rewards symptoms, and drank not only whiskey, teachers, Glen Fittich, famous grouse, Isle of Dura, if friends brought it as gifts, but wine and an aperitif called Punta Mez, an Italian vermouth characterised by one point of sweetness and half a point of bitterness, halfway between Rosso Vermouth and Campari. She disliked people who didn't drink and was open about it. 
seeing alcohol more as an inspirer than depressant, and in our friendship a loosener to peeling away some of the layers of personal guilt she felt able to confide in me. Her own profound understanding of inner states, particularly breakdown, emotional grief, loss, death, the anomalous and often acutely disturbing realities explored by poets, and the alienation experienced by those whose gifts differ from the demands of quantitative materialism, would have made her, to my mind, an exceptional Jungian analyst, as well as a poet. Booze is a good fixative for my personal recollections of Kathleen, for much of what she told me was over-drink and synaptic rather than linear. I'm writing this sitting outside in Leicester Square. There's a crystal sugar skull of rain clouds building over the Piccadilly entrance to the square, and a young busker riffing into a beat-up version of the Beatles' Here Comes the Sun that isn't going to send an acid days John Lennon back from the future. I'm crumbling grains of white Indian Valium into my palm as a habituated user, while a Thai girl sitting next to me, who has been periodically remarking on my handwriting, tells me that she's called Orn, and would I like to meet her there at the same place tomorrow? as she wants to know me. Kathleen's amalgamated, of course, into distractive brain chatter. And as Orne goes back to her local restaurant job, I refocus Kathleen as the mobile theme of my writing, while the busker goes retro again with The Price of Love. It was a theme often returned to by Kathleen in her attempts to incite why she was so destructively unsuited to relationships and so supportively constructive to real friendships. She told me that in neither of her two marriages had she achieved any degree of sexual pleasure. She was emphatic about that, and it quickly turned to sublimating her senses through an enhanced, almost mystical bond with nature that for her scientifically revealed itself to the senses as the universal heartbeat, a cellular organism she accessed through her poetry, not descriptively, but symbiotically, as though intuiting in nature the design or transcendent shape of lyric as it came up in its pure state. There's a total absence of the urban jungle in Kathleen's poetry, an omission of all the high-tech and edgy street energies that drive my own poetry, leaving her work in a way excerpted from time and place and focused only on themes she considered perennial and not subject to the oxidisation of change. It leaves her poetry curiously displaced from social context and constructed exactly in that way. And if my poetry is all about the transmission of speed, then hers is its polar opposite, the slowing into autonomic trance as its method of construction. The Blakean warrior in Kathleen is not to be found in her poetry, but in the combative stance of her prose, her Blake studies, her autobiographies, her quintessential commands for poetry in defending ancient strings, springs and the inner journey of the poet, in which her indomitable conviction that poetry is a way of life and not a careerist sideline, reached their optimal exponential. Nobody defended the committed poet's legacy as the unacknowledged legislator of the universe, in Shelley's phrase, harder than Kathleen, through her luminously directed prose and creative friendships that she saw as equal to her work. She repeatedly referred to universities as, quote, the enemies of imagination, seeing their role as reductive and her time spent teaching at Cambridge as creatively sterile and preferred to live on very little income, like Blake himself, rather than concede the essential freedom of the poet's role in society. I have known, never known anyone less materialistic than Kathleen. She was fortunate to own a Chelsea house got from a friend at a time when the quarter was a bohemian artist's barrio and high-end Chelsea, as yet unexploited by real estate profiteers. It was a period in the 40s when the poppy red-haired Quentin Crisp lived round the corner in Beaufort Street and became a friend of hers over tea and cafes. By the time I met Kathleen, 
she felt radically alienated in a square, metastatized by the greed of paramilitary financiers sealed into blacked-out jeeps as mobile fortresses. If Kathleen felt understandably angular to the Thatcher greed politics of the 80s, in which hedge funding diagnostics went viral and the arts were relegated to the ministerial backyard at a time when she desperately needed funding for her idea of a Temenos Academy, then her own natural resilience hardened. Driven by the notion <laughs> that Temenos should not only exist as a document expressing her beliefs in what she called, quote, the learning of the imagination, she conceived of acquiring a London building that would serve as a physical academy for students to study degree courses in the more esoterically based doctrines that she believed comprised a recognisable substrate to the collective psyche. What she looked for initially was private patronage, an exhaustive route in which tentative promises never properly materialised and the pursuit of which ate into her creative working time as well as increasing the frequency of her angina attacks that when I witnessed them would last for periods of five or ten minutes acutely discomforting pain. She started taking the prescription drug nitroglycerin to prevent chest pain, a nitrate vasodilator with a biological half-life of three minutes taken orally, and this brought considerable relief to the alarming pain that would sometimes inhibit her activities. In order to help fund the magazine, she sold off her valuable first editions of Thomas Taylor's translations of the Neoplatonists, the text that Blake dipped into, poets dip rather than read. So too, her personalised David Jones lettering in the design of her name that she kept framed above her worktop in the living room. Unstoppable in her conviction to concretise her beliefs, she was establishing an academy to house them, she prioritised Temenos over her own work, one of the demanding undertakings being an almost global correspondence. She was a great and untiring letter writer, mostly by hand. And despite the fact I saw her every few weeks, I received regular and often long letters from her in support of her beliefs or in the encouragement of my writing. She gave herself fully and generously in her letters to friends, and formidably and vehemently to her enemies. She took fierce issue with detractors and welcomed combat in the way Blake defiantly put down opponents. Kathleen had her internalised black book of enemies, mostly drawn from the literary world, making little or no allowance for their coexistence in her lifetime. She particularly disliked a genre of mainstream British fiction, I won't use the names, the sort of wallpaper fiction she termed discursive trivia. She tended with exceptions like Proust, Faulkner and Patrick White, who she strongly advocated, to regard fiction as a secondary resource to poetry, in which her frontline antipathies were largely directed at the Auden generation and to the misanthropic provincialism of Philip Larkin and the small realistic fieldwork of her poetry influenced by him. She repeatedly called their effort social reportage, seeing it as simply describing reality as reality to no other advantage to the reader. And if there's no exchange of reality, then writing is simply boring. Words should be chemical messengers and not unaltered signs. During the 90s, and considering herself underread, Kathleen undertook the gargantuan task of reading all of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, the entirety of Mathers's translation of the Arabian Nights, the Rig Feeders, Ezra Pound's Cantos, Great Choice, From Cover to Cover, Golding's Ovid, uh, directed to that by Pound, and a continuous stream of books on the esoteric and occult scientists gifted her by admirers. Review copies of books sent her by publishers were usually binned or sold on in piles to Chelsea Antique Books around the corner at World's End. I'm back writing in Leicester Square. Tomorrow, yesterday or today, it's all the same. I'm an alien tourist. An owner's on a lunch break like she's never left the last one. Spotting me, she comes over and asks if I'm writing a story. And I say, yes, everything's a story. And she takes her shoes off 
and shows me the damage done to her feet by waitressing. The money's shit, but she can't get another job. Disproportionately, I show her the damage done to my right index finger by writing, and she offers to massage it. I'm a strange attractor. I seem always to have this collusive effect on strangers. It starts to rain. It always does in Leicester Square. And I tell her, I'll see her yesterday, or do I mean tomorrow? It's all the same when you're writing. I go off to Patisserie Valerie on Soho's old Compton Street to continue this, and she back to work. I've deliberately avoided referencing Kathleen's autobiographies as backup, as autobiography is usually a metafiction for the life you would like to have lived but never did. In other words, it's mostly lies. Having just written one called Bandit Poet, I know the trick. It makes no difference anyway. It's how it's written counts. Nobody can validate facts as they belong to a past that is unverifiable. Can you really remember what happened tomorrow? In a very real sense, 47 Portland Square as Kathleen's modus operandi was her London hub. The domestic locale or slice of the city that provided her with a physical platform to oppose the creepy indifference of external politics with a counterposed inner hierarchy of symbols she conceived as Golganusa, the city within a city that Blake's Jerusalem argues as a reality. She engaged with the city through a busy social life, both at home and through attending functions in her capacity as Blake's secretary or a missary. It was a heroic quest that set her apart from most of her contemporaries, the idea that Blake's world is this world only seen differently, and your purchase on it is through perceiving it imaginatively as a quality of inner space. Kathleen was never pedantic about her knowledge of Blake's uncompromising affirmations of visionary reality. Rather, she shared generously in conversation, colouring a point often casually by a line that fitted, and often in me, to me in relation to work, eternity is in love with the reductions of time. In other words, don't waste a moment because it won't come up again. As the story comes from Thomas Gilchrist, who as Blake's first biographer pinched up as much of his Soho DNA as possible, that once stopping off for a drink of porter in a Soho pub, Blake was confronted by the angel Gabriel and reproached for taking time out and immediately returned to his work engraving plates for Flaxman's Hesiod, which was published in 1817. And for Kathleen, there was almost continuous rumble of emotional war with her family, all of which was run by me in great detail to approve psychological support for grievances carved into her tissues. Kathleen simply wouldn't tolerate the fact that neither of her children, Anna or James, gave her work the seriousness she felt it demanded. While becoming a personal friend of Anna's, I saw little of James, except for an ugly domestic row that occurred on one of my visits when James, partly stewed by Kathleen's liberal slugs of scotch, exploded on provocation into telling his mother he'd never read one of her books and never intended to, something that led to a violent row with James storming out and slamming the door. Unabashed by James's aggression, Kathleen told me that she was to blame for having partially disowned him, but was understandably affronted by what she called his denial of everything she stood for. At the time, Anna was temporarily living at Kathleen's and working at Watkins Bookshop in Cecil Court, a place with which Kathleen had a long and close association with its founder, Nigel Watkins, and through, and through the shop's importance to her in sourcing the esoteric books essential to her work, many of which live spines facing out on the shelves of her living room. As irascibly incontrovertible as her spiritual mentor, Blake, with whom she shared an almost osmotic empathy. Her reserves of compassion were correspondingly inexhaustible, and trouble in my life in the form of breakdowns, the suicides of close friends, and the general emotional mess that is part of life were taken on by her with a generosity of support and psychological knowledge supplied with unconditional love. 
She was quite unshockable. You could tell her anything, and she would incite it at source or find a parallel in the experience of friends and take it to depth and support grief or pain with solicitous concern. Death as a subject came up often, and she was at all times afraid to die, both as the termination of her work and identity, but also because she feared the existence of an afterlife as a system not supporting rest, but the continuity of unresolved aspects of personality. It may be that individuals overattached to a particularly self-identified and unrepeatable creative curve feel the loss of it more than those who are perhaps easily collectivized into their material role in society. If your gifts are special, you correspondingly value and fear their extinction. Death is hard as you are letting go, but will never come again in that particular physical form created specifically for that purpose in a moment in time. Kathleen was acutely aware of that, and her greatness came in part from acknowledging her transience and in attempting to build a legacy that would continue without her. She asked me from the earliest stages of our friendship if I would be one of the persons there when she came to die, and I was with her at the hospital hours before her death, when looking at me directly in the eyes blue iris on blue. She recited the passage from Blake on mercy, pity, peace and love as her last words to me. She was still expected to live when I went back home. I'd taken her a bunch of pink peonies and it was Thetis Blacker who was with her at the end, helping her let go into whatever death means. Kathleen loved life as it bounces on the senses. If you took her flowers, she inhaled the whole bunch as though her life depended on it. I loved English garden flowers that she cultivated, scented roses, fritillaries, mahonia and mimosa, camellias, lily of the valley, poppies, cornflowers, all of which she grew. And particularly giving me bunches of marzipan scented, jubilantly yellow mimosa on its arrival in the corners of spring. Her room was never without flowers, usually brought by friends, including myself, and observed by her pigment for pigment, inviting from her sometimes a line from Swedenborg on singularity, quote, No substance, state, or thing in the created universe can ever be the same or identical with any other. In her life, She combined the scientific with the aesthetic, in other words, the active ingredients of good writing, aware always of the adaptive interface between inner and outer realities as the site of poetry, and that the great unlimited inner spaces were there to be mined as inexhaustible resources. Blake's mythically constructed cosmogenies, realities to him, but often locking the reader out of his complex systems read to me like non-tech sci-fi, a mapping of warring exoplanets in which rocketry is replaced by mythic volatiles in a chaos reddened by apocalypse or psychosis. Kathleen's philosophical and metaphysical expositions of Blake's schematic approach genius, but they are, of course, individual interpretations coloured by a lifetime's immersion in his furious, chiliastic vision. She certainly inherited from Blake an aggressive antagonism to any faction critical of her policies. Intensely focused, she wrote papers, essays, reviews, introductions fast and often without reference as her knowledge was fluently consummate and there on demand. She wrote poems in diminishing number, longhand into journals and would read me new work always in exchange for mine. Like all good writers, she was simple in her method and eloquent in the results, seeing as I do, as natural as oxygen. While she cared nothing for material rewards, she was concerned about her literary reputation, repeatedly asking me if I thought her work would outlive her as value to future generations. Who survives is rather like trying to select a single raindrop in a whizzing downpour. Who knows where the sparkler lands? And she'd tell me, quote, all of my life I've worked like a black for no result, and the whiskey would usually soften or blur the edges of her jangly dilemma. 
like all creative people who hope in some way to be remembered, she faced the excruciating crisis of having to let go work she could no longer control or rehabilitate in her favour. And of course it's not easy walking out with no future physical claim on work you've spent a lifetime perfecting. Of course it pissed her off, as the prospect does me, or anyone who does something special that may be imported into the future. For some reason, Kathleen's big snarl was with Sylvia Plath's posthumous afterlife. For me, arguably and indubitably one of the greatest of 20th century poets. Her blitzkrieg of stunning imagery and stripped-down confessional focus, pushing her so far down the sliding line of posterity that she will never go away. Kathleen was for some reason in full-on contention with Plath over a posthumous merit she intended to succeed and refused to read Plath properly, her crushing put-down, trading off her conviction that Plath's reputation was secured more by her suicide than the legitimate property of her electrifying poetry that puts a dopamine wallop into the brain. But Kathleen wouldn't have it, and while she made allowance for Robert Lowell's documentation of manic breakdown in his seminal life studies on the grounds of his sweeping mythic archetypes into his disruptive mania, no such allowance was granted Sylvia Plath. All the more pathologised hysteria of Anne Sexton as still another suicide in the escalating personal tragedies that littered the pre-millennial build of late 20th century poetry. It wasn't only that she wouldn't have it, but she wouldn't read it. Diane Makoski, Rochelle Owens, Adrian Risch, Bernadette Meyer, Denise Levratov, Veronica Forrest Thompson, she wouldn't give them existence or acknowledge their place in the atmosphere. She complained instead that she herself had given too little time to poetry and too much to prose, and that now it was irreversible. She set about assembling her collective writings on Yeats for Leanne Miller's Dolman Press, the last book he was to oversee the publication in 1986 as he was dying of cancer and sent him a box of champagne to help palliate an end narrowing on him the following year. Kathleen was dissatisfied with her own input in that book, telling me that Francis Yates, whose books like The Art of Memory and Giordano Brino and The Hermetic Tradition she so admired, would have researched the esoteric side much deeper, but that she wanted to bring her Yates studies to a conclusion, as she had sort of fallen out of love with his work romantically, describing the first drafts of his poems to me as pedestrian. Blake, on the other hand, remained irreducibly, iconically her undiminished avatar, shining a light into her intrinsically and how she perceived London, the alternative one he'd built into its financial towers and floating archipelagos of office space. She looked for the diagram of his Jerusalem in her daily life and told me of the times when a delusionally schizoid David Gascoigne would take refuge with her and set out to, at night to walk across the city, returning at dawn as the amphetamine he'd taken wore off, and telling her sometimes everything in the room had turned gold as part of his alchemical quest to literally see the sun at midnight. In the early 50s, the sustained chaos his schizophrenia <coughs> brought into her life led to a severance in their relationship that lasted for a decade, and again she blamed herself repeatedly for having forced him out of her life as his illness grew to intrude on her disciplined work. Kathleen was instrumental in keeping David away from toxic psychiatry, insisting quite rightly he should see only Jungian analysts and incite his scrambled, paranoid symptoms archetypally as the therapy best suited to his particular visionary type. She told me how David would lie on the bed all day burnt out by conflicting radio in his head, voices that opposed his creative processes with often brutally obscene intervention. Apart from a generic predisposition to schizophrenia, David was also suffering episodes of amphetamine psychosis that had him proclaim the second coming in the streets. 
when in the mid-80s I completed my first non-fiction book, Madness, the Price of Poetry, and a Kathleen from Quest read her parts of the book in process, she again selflessly and generously informed Peter Owen of the book's deeply empathetic focus, advising him to publish it and initialising a long and productive association with his publishing house that was the result of my continuing to publish fiction and non-fiction books with him as an outstanding independent publisher, known always <clears throat> for pushing the edge. And while Peter, over the years, made regular requests to Kathleen for a book of essays, she never took him up on it, reluctant to assemble a new book after the very low sales of the inner journey of the poet that she told me didn't even amount to 300 copies. I think, like most poets, she felt she was waiting, writing for no one, but was undeterred in her conviction. She was emphatic in telling me that at the moment of death, the question asked is whether you have honoured your purpose or calling, and she was clear she'd attempted her best in giving her all. Have Kathleen found gay men more conducive company, partly due to her own psychological androgyny, then falling in love unrequitedly with Gavin Maxwell, a neighbour of Portland Square, and feeling, of course, physically rejected, only further compounded her sense of inconsolable loss, although she was willing to concede that her principal romance was, of course, her Blakean studies, and that human relations lived in the shadow of that luminously personalised nimbus. To me, she always shone as the brightest thing in the room, her aura, a solid shape of condensed purple, blue, green and orange arabesques coalescing into a molecular cone, comparable sometimes to the lurid sunset over world's end just down the road from her. There were boxes of organic vegetables arrived from Highgrove every two weeks. Kathleen used to mark up passages of literature for Prince Charles to read on flights and was his sort of unofficial literary guru. She used to ask me to read the personal handwritten letters in blue ink that he sent her on crested paper, some of them relating to his misconceived marriage to Diana, and often carrying highly sensitive information about his parents considering his attraction to the green world and his superficial knowledge of world religion as deeply injurious to his media profile, writing in a memorable phrase that he would never be king by reason of his parents considering him hazardly unconventional, and in his own words, mad. Charles's secretary would on occasions finance the publication of Temenos, conditional to a piece by Charles appearing in the issue, heavily edited and in parts rewritten by Kathleen. Like me, Kathleen lived in part from selling her papers to her archive, and Charles's letters were carefully concealed in a folder for this purpose of preservation. In the week succeeding her death, MI5 entered her house at Porton Square, temporarily occupied by Liz, her granddaughter, and stole the files for the obvious reason of their potentially toxic contents being leaked to the press. It's an odd juxtaposition to think of Blake's secretary being under the surveillance of secret intelligence, but Kathleen believed in an ideal hierarchical world in which poets should be patronised by princes, even though her objective to secure a property from Charles as a composite Temenos Academy repeatedly failed to find concretisation. No longer writing very much poetry, she bought an Irish black wool cape to assert what she called a poetic presence at social functions. Like me, she believed you should look like what you do as the physical adjunct to your art. My long afternoons with her comprised an extraordinary privileged, hands-on education of shared ideas. Disagreement with Kathleen on my part never occurred. I listened and pushed in my ideas where they seemed to connect. We spoke regularly of aliens, I'm one, or visitors from the future as already here in the transitioning morph of one gene into another, in the sense that in a seminal essay on inner space as the pioneering province of science fiction J.G. Ballard memorably named Earth as the only alien planet. What for me are aliens? Well, for Kathleen, the archetypal states realised in Blake's visionary schematic of the human city. One essential that Kathleen and I always considered paramount 
was that poets need luxuries and not necessities. In other words, expensive clothes, books, booze, scents, taxis, teas, jewellery, etc. The aesthetic always overriding the practical in optimising sensory pleasure at the expense of boring material investment. Kathleen only used Roger et Gallet soaps, something I do too, selecting her favourite flower of osmanthus, or on a soberer note, green tea. For recipients of hand-labelled jars, she also made <clears throat> the crunchiest, most citric, tangy, whisky-tinctured orange marmalade, her intuitively blended mixology being done <clears throat> in the autumn as a deep umber treat. Sometimes, sometimes in the late afternoon when I was visiting her, we'd be joined by Norman, whose role in Kathleen's life was to bring seriously priced black vintage to the evening, wines that Norman treated as intelligent entities, uncorking and leaving to room temperature sometimes for two hours before pouring. Norman handled wine as an experienced nose and took me independently to restaurants that nurtured his sort of broody reds, neither of us eating anything, but just concentrating on the wine's variable, coercive moods. There's still another of Kathleen's special gay friends singularly devoted to mystic pathways. Norman in his bespoke charcoal pinstripes held bottles like a snake handler looking to contain a red serpentine muscle escaping the bottle. Indefatigably courageous and generally well despite intermittent panic brought on by angina, Kathleen lived into her 90s without any form of home help, fully active and singularly focused on consolidating her belief in Blake's expansively visionary perception in which imaginative reality supersedes secondary or quantitative existence. I never knew her depressed, despondent sometimes at the refutal of her work by mainstream critics, but always above it with an overview that the inner cosmogony star-mapped by Blake existed totally independent of reductionist policies. For Kathleen, inner had become a total immersive reality, a space into which to die as a continuity of the state in which he lived and believed. And of enduring importance to me, she introduced me to her close friend and teacher, Prince Kumar, who continues to this day to be a light cone in my life, the guide to all inner signposting through the application of science to spirituality, never separating the transcendent from the human crisis of living, and interacting with the likes of Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs and Christopher Isherwood in helping them reconcile the necessary underside to creative experience to its counterposed higher state. As Blake so appositely stated, quote, there is no thought without mind. So Kumar recognises that dark and light are interdependent in the place they occupy in creative experience. Otherwise, there is a seriously defective imbalance in the poetic genome. Those who aspire to, aspire to higher consciousness reach it through journeying by way of the underbelly into a more realised design. If you always sit on top of the mountain, you miss the struggle in getting there. Kathleen worked hard on herself in her later years to try and unify the necessary symbiosis of good and bad in her life, both being indispensable to the human condition. She trusted Blake as having the right mass. She once wrote down for me on the spot in my troubles, quote, from Blake, learn therefore, O sisters, to distinguish the eternal human that walks about among the stones of fire in bliss and woe, alternate from those states or world in which the spirit travels. You can't have one without the other, and she anticipated in her own way, if it exists, what she called an equally troubled afterlife. If the individual survives death with some sort of parallel awareness, then I hope Kathleen encounters Blake, for she gave most of her life to him and the teachings he won in such a hard, lonely way as an assumed, unintelligible psychotic. 
I go back and sit down in Leicester Square. Where else do I go? I write a poem called Don't You Bother Me about my own alienation in the crowd. A stringy guy who's lost half of his flesh comes up to me and says he's got everything I need. And I tell him I've got my own drug poetry. Before he dematerializes, like he's walked off into a parallel reality. You meet them all there, like today's tomorrow. Most writers only encounter writing when they work. I meet strangers who often become friends. Orn shows up after 30 minutes, carrying a little plastic lunchbox, and having told her I'm vegan, she tells me she's made something especially for me. She shows me her damaged feet again like she's been treading on plums. I've almost finished my poem, and she asks me what it's about, and I just say, me. There's a damp chill in the air, and I can see from build in the sky it's going to rain, and my jacket is too expensive to ruin. I need some strong tea as riding shreds my nerve terminals, and I ask her if she'd like to join me for tea and cake. What else do you do mid-afternoon when you've just finished writing a poem? And although she hardly knows me, she links her arm through mine and says, hurry, it's going to rain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for a talk which was poetic, dramatic, and controversial Mm. in a way that I think Kathleen would thoroughly have enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to finish by reading to you a poem which I think is very apposite, particularly to Greville, who is such a great admirer of Robert Graves. I can only describe Robert Graves as a magician. Kathleen, too, was a big admirer of his book, The White Goddess. So, as we're in the winter, I'm going to read you a poem which will tell you everything magical you can't comprehend but know. It's by Robert Graves called To Juan at the Winter Solstice. There is one story, and one story only that will prove worth your telling. Whether as learned bard or gifted child, To it, all lines or lesser gourds belong that startle with their shining such common stories as they stray into. Is it of trees, you tell, their months and virtue, of strange beasts that beset you, of birds that croak at you the triple will, or the zodiac? And how slow it turns below the boreal crown, prison of all true kings that ever reigned. Water to water, arc again to arc, from woman back to woman, so each new victim treads unfalteringly the never altered circuit of his fate, bringing twelve peers as witness both to his starry rise and starry fall? Or is it of the virgin's silver beauty, or fish below the thighs? She in her left hand holds a leafy quince, when with her right she crooks a finger smiling, how may the king hold back? Royally then he barters life for love. Or at the undying snake from chaos hatched, whose coils contain the ocean, into whose chops with naked sword he springs, then in black water, tangled by the reeds, battles three days and nights to be spewed up beside her scalloped shore. Much snow is falling, falling, winds roar hollowly, The owl hoots from the elder. Fear in your heart cries to the loving cup. Sorrow to sorrow as the sparks fly upward. The log groans and confesses there is one story and one story only. Dwell on her graciousness. Dwell on her smiling. Do not forget what flowers the great Trampled down in ivy time. 
Her brow was creamy as the crested wave. Her sea blue eyes were wild, but nothing promised that is not performed. That's Robert Graves to Juan at the winter solstice. So you can ask me if, if Stephen thinks there's enough time, a few questions if you want to, about Kathleen or me writing in Leicester Square, whatever you choose. <laughs> Sutherland, yes. who looked after her children, was, was she the person who David Jones... Yes, that's right, connection. same connection, yeah. that's right. Yeah, Kathleen loved David Jones very deeply. And used to tell me stories of visiting him and how he lived on grapefruit and whiskey and boiled eggs because he was highly agoraphobic, of course, and could hardly go out. <laughs> Poets need those things, <laughs> particularly the whiskey. Oh, I don't think there was anything to resolve. Those things can't be resolved. They just go on. They die when you die. You said towards the beginning there was very little materialism yes. in, in her. Yes. Some of the things you said towards the end um, conflicted with that a bit. No, I was suggesting that poets like myself and her much prefer luxuries to necessities and so whenever Kathleen had money she bought luxuries and not necessities she would very often give me money and say to me go and buy a beautiful scarf or go and buy a Roger Galley soap that's what poets live by and believe in the rest is immaterial so that wasn't materialism <laughs> it is materialism but it's deserved materialism <laughs> <laughs> poets deserve continuous spoiling and luxuries of course they do Yes, I of course it is. I love flowers and it's a nice Of flowers. course. You know, we've forgotten these old pleasures. They're not that expensive. Exactly. And they make the day. <laughs> Whiskey? Yeah, of course. Only <laughs> <laughs> good stuff, though. What work have you written about Kathleen apart from that lecture? I don't, that's not a lecture, it's a talk. I never give lectures. Because um, I hate lectures. Um, I don't think I've written about Kathleen, no. That's uh, something I've always personalised within myself because every molecule in me is filled with her gold and she gave me so much that it sparkles every time I write a word. She had that particular ability for the friend she loved to give you this huge Blakean gold rush of energies. So I carry that all the time. I thank her every minute for what she gave me. Huge friendship, supports, understanding of breakdowns, whatever, whatever. Kathleen would have been better than any psychiatrist or psychologist that could ever have lived because she understood the whole archetypal connection and the human pain of which she was full of herself, of course. So she understood pain deeply and she was quite unshockable. You could tell her anything about anything and she would incite it because being shocked isn't part of poetry. It's part of, I don't know, academe, but certainly not poetry. Does anyone know what happened to the letters from Prince Charles? I guess MI5, um, probably they went into dematerialization, Jerry, I guess. They were interesting letters. I mean, they weren't particularly original or anything of that nature. They were mainly com letters complaining about the straitjacketing of his own emotional life. Um green interests. She always asked me to read them. Um, she liked to share those with me as she did most very confidential things. No one had copies of them? Right? No. She used to sell, like me, everything she wrote to archives and so she was planning those to go on. She received very beautiful letters, handwritten letters from the poet Robert Duncan, which were much more interesting. Robert Duncan's handwriting alone was something quite extraordinary. And she managed to get Robert Duncan to do some versions of the poet Rumi for Temenos. Um, he asked for no money for doing it. He said, just send me an esoteric book that you might get from Watkins or something. Hmm. I wanted to ask you about, did you ever read Prince Charles's poetry or his attempts at it? 
No, he never sent any poetry. Kathleen's job was to, because he was too busy, she used to mark up passages in books for him to read on air flights. So she'd mark up some Blake or Shelley or whatever it was to try and open him out a bit to a world in which he was partially interested or assumed he had to be a little bit interested in. So that's all she did. Yes, he never wrote any poetry. What he did write for Demonos was occasional ecological essays of a very boring nature, um, which she would have to heavily edit and partially rewrite. But that got money for the publication because then his secretary would pay for the printing of what was a beautiful magazine and very expensive to produce. So he was very helpful and indirectly in that respect. But mercifully, he didn't try to write poetry. Yes, I did. Sorry, we've got a question over here. Yes. It's not so much a question, really, but uh, just an observation. I liked very much your presentation of Kathleen as you knew her. I am myself the son of Michael Roberts and Janet Adam Smith, who, of course, were long time friends of Kathleen's. Mm. Yes. Uh, my mother who lived almost as long as Kathleen did, yes. uh, to the end, regarded herself half-teasingly as your boring old friend. They would see each other sometimes as much as once a week. Mm -hmm. If my mother was dropping in after going to the Scots Church in Columbus, Bond Street and then going on mm. to Bolton Square. Right. And uh, I'd just like to say that while I think that everything you said about Kathleen is, I, I recognise that she had perhaps a little more room, at least at certain times of day, mm. certain seasons of the year, yes. for boring old friends. Yes, or I even, have. <laughs> even <laughs> the, uh, um, people of her generation whom in a way she discarded or put at a distance uh, after all William Empson uh, yes. Humphrey Jennings yes. uh, and I think she recognised them. Empson of course was still a true poet yes absolutely had been. Humphrey Jennings also clearly had the, the poetic fire yes and she was very good in making time for <laughs> the Jennings family after Humphrey was killed in 1950, I think it was. Yes, which would have been an element of her compassion, of course. That's right. And she did a very good Boxing Day party with children. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to... Thank you for telling me those things. That I'd was just like to say that... Mm. She was, in fact, perfectly believable to a child, at least. Yes. A teenager. As a mother. Yes. This is not a role mm. that she mm. particularly enjoyed that. Yes. But she, nonetheless, had what I think we can call mm -hmm. maternal instincts. Yes. Being yes. Pompous. Absolutely. So... That was really all I wanted to say about oh, but Thank you very much. And kind of trimming. Yes. Or, or it, adds, it adds a very useful aspect. Definitely. Okay. Thank you very much for that insight, which was before I knew Kathleen. Yes. So thank you very much mm. for giving me some past in that very personal way. Thank mm. you so much. I have a small anecdote. Yes. I was doing a book of um, an anthology, and I wanted to include one of her poems. Yes. And she was very generous. And everyone else who I included in the anthology asked for money. So I said, you know, how much are you going to charge? And she said, nothing. Yes. She said, because I want my poetry to be widely read. That's right. So, That's a very nice yeah. experience, typical of her yeah. and her incredible generosity yeah. on very little money. She was enormously generous. Mm. And she would give you, if you looked at anything or admired anything, she would give it to you straight away on the spot. Um, so it was wise not to admire too much at <laughs> on visiting her because she would give you any books that you looked at and liked um, and all sorts of things. She was quite extraordinary. Yes? Um, sorry, I might have got off a bit. Off a bit fast. Yeah. Did, did you tell us uh, how she approached uh, the prince? Did you tell us that? Or if you didn't, what came into 
into her mind that she was contacting to support? Well, you know, she very much lived in the hope that when she formed Temenos, where we are here now as the Temenos Academy talk, that she would have an actual building in which students could come and study more esoteric sciences, more imaginative things than they can at normal, boring universities. So, very much her aim was to try and secure the patronage of Charles or somebody like him to give her a building. And she was very disappointed when a building that Charles owned near Regent's Park was, wasn't allocated to her, but he actually sold it on. So she felt very let down on that thing. He also used to send her the same brooch every birthday. Um, exactly the same one which came from Gerard's year after year after year. She used to say to me, I've got the same brooch again. <laughs> why, why did he contact him then? Because he, no, no, he, he contacted her. She, she took over from somebody called Lawrence van der Post, who was Charles' spiritual advisor. When Lawrence van der Post died, Charles asked Kathleen if he would become her sort of literary spiritual guru. She was unpaid for it, but given organic vegetables, and invited up to Highgrove in all of that, but she just tried to point him in directions that would, you know, give him a bit more insight into a world that he was probably denied by his position, into reading things that could kind of blow his mind, but probably didn't, but in some aspect got to him. <laughs> Can't imagine Charles having his mind blown, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, we have a question. Yes. Yes, and, um, that's great. <laughs> he um, always struck me as someone who sort of danced in that world of, I suppose we could call it a mental illness, but it danced in the world of mm. not quite here in this world, but not. And do you suppose it was her love of Blake that almost made her a sympathetic ear to someone like David Gascoigne, who also suffered from mental illness and saw a, almost a kinship in the two? Yes, very much. And I think, you know, poetry is inseparable from mental illness and breakdown. It's part of a journey. And almost all poets have breakdowns on that journey, like Robert Graves has put into metaphor in that poem I read you. It is a journey. And of course, yes, David Gascoigne, who I knew very well and was exceedingly beautiful as a young person, almost like a god fallen out of the sky, he was so beautiful. David had schizophrenic breakdowns, voices. Um, and was totally marvellous. I did a lot of performances with David. I used to go to Liberties and buy him beautiful silk ties because David loved ties and always dressed in pinstripe suits and beautiful ties and shirts. Kathleen had looked after David in a certain period of time because David had no money, no job, never could have ever held a job. Um, and so he periodically stayed with her in periods of bad breakdown and lack of money. David was patronised by Peter Watson, also a friend of Kathleen's, who was a very rich gay millionaire who put up money for people like David when he needed it. But David wore velvet suits and had no money. When I say poets need luxuries, not necessities. Okay, yeah. I feel like we wear our, our, our breakdowns as well as our of course. Of the of course. And Blake clearly had undergone breakdown, but of course it wasn't probably diagnosable then, so it was put into the extraordinary visionary content of his work, of course, rather than what some diagnostic psychiatrists would call psychosis. It was simply unleashed as a storm of energy. Well, I think Kathleen. Uh, hmm, I think Kathleen, you know, would have been sympathetic to almost all states, but you know, she, the androgynous state she looked for, wasn't so much transgender as kind of you know, the embodiment of masculine and feminine in one body, um, unaltered surgically or anything of that nature. She saw that as the real archetype, the sort of Socratic archetype 
whereby the male femininity is stronger than the female masculinity, which was very much her argument as to why, in her mind, I'm not saying in my mind at all, but in her mind she saw men as more creatively productive for that reason. Now, there's a huge counter-argument against that. And I was once at a talk she gave when a lot of women walked out precisely because of those views. But she remained undeterred about that. Um, she saw the male androgyne, the feminized male, as the carrier of a particular psychological journey that she herself was on and admired. But yes, she would have taken transgender into enormous sympathy, of course. She would have related it back to a particular archetype with the Byzantine or the Roman emperors who treasured eunuchs, etc., etc. Um, she would have seen its whole historic context. Yeah, definitely. Any last question? So, I thank you so much. Remains. And for me to thank Gravel and for me to thank Stephen Overy for inviting me and I hope to come back next year as I do once a year. Delighted to have you. And perhaps resume David Bowie, which I did last year for the Terminos Academy. The Great Star Man. Part two. Thank you.